Hey everybody, how's everyone doing today? All right, so let me tell you guys a little bit about the software. We are using Zoom webinars today. So this is a little bit different software. If you've been to one of our webinars before, it was on a different software platform. And so we are actually gonna be utilizing the chat here if you have something to say. And then if you have questions, uh, we're gonna, there's a Q&A tab. So I'm just gonna explain a little bit about the, the software, just a couple more things. Zooming in and out, that's on your end. Uh, what you should see right now is, by the way, can everyone hear me? Yep, people can hear me in the chat. All right, and I apologize about the facial hair. Uh, all the barbers in Arizona are closed. And so Matt called it uh, my beard eating my face earlier today when we were doing a test run. So apologize in advance. Uh, again, I, uh, I have to conform to the rules here. So facial hair is part of the process. Are you guys excited for the webinar today? I am. This will be a lot of fun. This is honestly one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> Very responsible of me. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. You know, I, I love doing this with you guys. And when you guys interact in the comments, it makes it a lot more fun for me. Uh, so I'm going to kind of keep an eye on the comments as I'm going through. And then there's a Q&A as well. If you look at the little top area at the top, you can see the Q&A and you guys seem to be finding the chat. So it should be a lot of fun. Is pretty much everybody off? I mean, it's hard to find a convenient time when there's everyone's off. But uh, hopefully this was a convenient time for everybody. And I'll, I'll wait to get started on the top of the hour. Um, does anybody have any technical issues or anything they want to report right now while we're still kind of getting started? A little bit too much skin showing. <laughs> really? Oh, man. You think so, huh? I don't know about that. I feel like I, could, I got skin right here. But pretty much the rest of this whole thing is just facial hair. I'm going to keep uh, facial hair talk to a, uh, a minimum after we, uh, <laughs> after we get rolling here. But in the meantime, I guess we can talk about it if that's what wants to come up. See, people are still kind of filing in. Yeah, and Matt made a good point that you can change their chat to all panelists and attendees. So if you go into the chat area on Zoom, uh, you can select all panelists, and then you can kind of get let in on the conversation as it's going around. Uh, that way it's fun. You can interact with the people here. And again, I'm going to keep my eye on the chat. I like the chat. It's fun. Let's make this enjoyable. You know, it's at the end of the day, I'm not, I mean, there's been so many boring webinars. Let's just call them what they are. You know, been a lot of boring webinars that we've been, you know, inundated with. And let's have this one be fun. You know, I'm not here to, let's just have a good time. Practice acquisitions is probably my favorite topic out there. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming most people here listen to our show because, you know, they're either on our Facebook group or our email list. And, uh, you know, you guys just know I'm, not, I, I'm very biased in the things that I believe. And, you know, that is just the way I am, a typically pretty opinionated person. And practice acquisitions, in my mind, are just the best way to get into ownership. And so I'm really excited to talk about the webinar today. I'm going to go ahead and get started a few minutes early. Uh, I think we got a lot of people here. And, uh, you know, we'll get, you know, people will trickle in and they might miss some of the introduction, but most of you guys know who I am anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I appreciate uh, all you guys for tuning in. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. And again, all questions, let's put them in the Q&A. So there's a Q&A setting in Zoom webinar and you click on that Q&A setting, you put your questions and answers, and then I'm probably going to wait till the end and then I'll go through all your questions and answer them. Some of them I can type an answer in there and the other ones I'll just answer live. And then you'll know that your question has been acknowledged if you put it in the Q&A, not the chat. The chat's for funny comments and whatnot and we'll have a good time with it. But uh, the Q&A is for your questions that you want to make sure get answered. So let me tell you guys a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is George Hariri. I'm a dentist here in Phoenix, graduated from Midwestern in 2018. Uh, so dental school in Phoenix. And then uh, I'm the co-host of the Shared Practices podcast. I'm one of many co-hosts now. My goodness, there's six of us on air. And, uh, you know, Richard started it, obviously. And then I joined him almost coming up on three years now. And then now we have Macarino as a partner. And then we have our three interns, Clay, Aaron, and Tyler are on our shows. And so the six of us have a lot of fun producing the Shared Practices podcast. It's now the number one rated podcast in dentistry, something we're really proud of. And, um, you know, after I graduated in 2018, a couple months later, I bought a practice and they were doing a little over a million dollars. 
and I was really pissed, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I was pretty pissed. Uh, COVID timing for me was a little bit of a, a hard thing because the, my, I had just started getting momentum in my practice and we were on track in March. It was my first month breaking 200K. So I was really excited about that. We were on track for 220. And uh, with COVID kind of hitting right in the middle of the month, we ended up at about 177, uh, which was still uh, a little about double pre ownership numbers, you know, so their, their last year, their last March. So, you know, we've had a lot of growth. I, I'd say almost doubled because of COVID. I think without COVID at this point, we'd be about double the pace of when I bought it uh, 18 months ago. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been more than I could have ever expected. And, you know, it's just been, I, I can't say enough positive things about practice ownership from my perspective. I really love everything about it. And, um, you know, that's kind of what, that's kind of what keeps me going with shared practices. You know, I, I don't have to do this. I love doing this. And I joined Richard Lowe three years ago on the Shared Practices podcast. We added Macarino, like I talked about before. And our mission is really pretty simple. We help dentists, in, in my mind, we help dentists maximize their income and career satisfaction. And one thing that you'll hear talking about me or talking, you know, things that I say, and the more I'm on air, the more it becomes a topic, is career satisfaction. We teach you how to make more money. That's very straightforward and obvious. But how to be happier in your career is equally, if not more important than your income. Everyone can maximize their income in dentistry, but can you do it in a way that allows you to be happy as well? And that's what I feel we really do at Shared Practices. And that's what makes me really proud of what we do at Shared Practices. So before the webinar ends, you're going to see how, right, COVID is obviously the big thing going on in our lives. I mean, I can't go outside because of COVID. Well, I do, but like, I can't do a whole lot. And you'll see, you know, how does this impact the dental acquisition market? So people looking to buy a practice, how does that impact you? And ultimately, you know, I think, uh, well, here's Warren Buffett. He's uh, one of the richest men in the world. I don't know where he is on the list, but I know he's not number one. And he has this great saying, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And so this is the way we want to look at, we want to look at COVID is we don't want to get caught in the whole, right? Let's, let's, the public health concern is a very large concern. People are dying and we need to be very cautious as dentists, as we practice. That is not what I'm referring to. Uh, the generalized fear that COVID creates economically and the fear in a lot of dentists who potentially be, could become future practice owners, all of that is very relevant to today's dental market, right? You have a lot of things changing and I don't want people to buy into the, the, the fear that's going around in a lot of the dental Facebook groups. And ultimately, what can we control and what can't we control? We cannot control the spread of the virus as individual dentists. You know, we can do our part, which we are, but ultimately what we can do is look at the situation and say, how can this propel my career forward in the best way possible? You cannot change the situation. We do not want the pandemic. However, since the pandemic is here, what can we do moving forward? And I, I love this quote, um, man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. So it, it's really all about the courage of leaving and entering the uncertainty and uh, really making something happen for themselves. And, and, that, and that's ultimately what we're, what we're trying to ask you guys to do. So, and again, I see the Q and A going, I'm happy that it's in there. I'll answer all the Q and A's towards the end. Uh, but you know, I'm going to keep rolling along here and I'm going to talk about how COVID has benefited dental practice buyers. So we have been in a long time seller's market. And for the first time in as long as I can remember, we are now entering a period that may, may as well very well be a buyer's market. And the reason is a lot of retirement age dentists, I mean, I, I've been talking to brokers and right, this is what I've heard from brokers, bankers, lawyers, people I've been talking to. Everyone's kind of thinking the same thing for the most part, right? Maybe some brokers are trying to sugarcoat the situation because they have to sell practices. But for the most part, a lot of dentists right now are calling brokers to get rid of their practices. This freaked them out. And practice prices, they're going to naturally take a dip because you have a lot less buyers in the market because it scared people. I mean, this is scary, you know, as a, as a practice owner, you know, to be, have to close your doors and pay all of your bills and everything. It's not an attractive situation for ownership right now. So people are scared of it. A lot of buyers are not, you know, this was, a, this made them a little gun shy, the security of the associateship potentially, but I mean, associateships haven't been super secure either. So there are less buyers right now willing to pull the trigger on certain practices. 
And if you saw my email inbox, you would see that fear that's very, very strong among buyers. But banks, for, you know, banks are all having their own policies about this. So it depends on the bank. You know, you have some large banks that are just shutting down all lending. And then you have some smaller banks or some regional banks that are very open to lending to practices once they get back open. You know, lending to buy practices once they're back open, seeing patients with a similar number of patient flow, you know, very much, you know, available to lend. So I think the one thing that is, you know, ultimately up for grabs is the DSOs. Nobody knows how they're going to react yet. And they're one of the major buyers in the market. And so a lot of these DSOs are over leveraged, which means they've, they have more debt than their cash flow or potentially their cash reserve support. And so this could be a period for them to really have gotten scared and realize that, okay, maybe we were a little over leveraged and kind of slow down their growth a little bit. And, you know, if that happens now, all of a sudden the number of buyers in the market continues to go down. And again, this is potentially opening up what could be a really great buyer's market. And I'm not just saying that, like, I am acting on this. I am very much looking to buy an additional practice or two because of the situation. So I'm very much going, I've, I've been very tuned into this because it affects my life. And this is going to very much, it, it's an opportunity that's very unusual. And if you're like, I see here as a D1, you know, obviously three, four years from now, five, six years, whenever you're ready to buy a practice, like it's probably not COVID is going to be like a super big uh, thing, but learning from the situation and looking at it and learning about buying practices, this is no better time because everyone has time off right now. So if I've convinced you to buy a practice, I think I've, if I talk to anybody for long enough, you know, ultimately I'll probably uh, convince somebody to buy a practice at some point. So where do we start? I always think the best place to start is looking at the desired practice model that you have, you know, begin with the end in mind. So there's two different types of practices that we talk about a lot, especially on the show is, you know, a solo practice, like a doctor practicing by themselves without another dentist. And so typically a smaller office. You typically have a smaller team because, you know, there's less people, less moving parts. Uh, there's a lot less management due to that smaller team. And then ultimately you'll have lower overhead. And your success, your financial success as a solo doc has a lot to do with your ability to clinically produce, right? Your ability to communicate with patients, your ability to communicate effectively with your team and your ability to communicate treatment. So, you know, that, that has a lot to do with it. And conversely, not conversely in an entire sense, but on a slightly different model is, you know, a group practice model. And this is the practice model that I practice in. We have a larger office. We have two doctors, a larger team, team of 13 now, and uh, a lot more management responsibility, a lot higher overhead. And your success as an owner is a lot more dependent on your management and your ability to grow the practice and be the visionary behind it and all of that stuff. So it's just deciding what problems you want. Do you want your success to be more dependent on your skills as a dentist, your procedure mix, your ability to communicate with patients, your ability to sort of navigate all of the challenges that dentists have, or do you want your success to be more based on your ability to ultimately lead a larger team, handle the stress, the overhead stress? I mean, overhead stress is real. You know, a lot of these practices and mine included have overhead of over a hundred thousand dollars a month. So you have to manage that well, and you have to manage that stress well. And we're not going to talk about multi-practice uh, that's just like a whole nother complicated thing that I don't even want to get into. So now how does that change your path to ownership, right? Once you decide on what track you want, you got to figure out how am I going to get there? And it has a lot to do with the problems that each of those things are going to present. So a solo practice owner, for example, if I decide, you know what, I'm a little bit more introverted. I am really clinically, you know, diverse in my skill set. I like doing a lot of different types of dentistry. I like kind of keeping things simple, maybe lower overhead, smaller team. And then the solo practice appeals to me. Now, your picture of when you're looking to buy a practice is you have a lot more inventory. There are the 80% of those practices available are probably good fits for a solo, right? Five, four ops, something like that, maybe six. You know, smaller number of operatories. Don't say three ops. It's, it's kind of a running joke, but I just have this aversion towards three op practices, two ops and one op. I mean, I don't even know. But anyway, a lot of those are quicker transitions because of the fact that 
ultimately, you know, it's a one doctor show. You're just swapping out old doctor for new doctor. There's not a big transition there where they're working together and all that stuff typically because it's usually a smaller office and there's not a whole lot of, you know, it's like, hi, you're the new guy. I'm the old guy. I see you. maybe a couple weeks of crown seats and that's it. The group practice, there's a lot more of nuance in that transition. You know, a lot of times the seller stays on. You got to typically, sometimes there's an associate already working there. It's a lot more complex, the transition, especially because of the dentist situation. And a lot less of those practices are available because we said 80% of all practices, let's say, are solo practices. So ultimately, when you're looking to buy a practice, the inventory of things to look at, because ultimately you can't, I mean, people do this, but it's not a really smart move to buy like a four op practice with the desire of having a group practice because it's just too small. So you want to buy the correct number of operatories, which immediately limits the number of practices available to you. So if we're looking at the biggest keys to success, the solo practice doc, it's your ability to, I mean, you need to find opportunities as well. Don't get me wrong, but you have a 80% of the practices available fit you well. And so you need to be able to screen them quickly and look at, look at them, decide which one is best for you. And ultimately you get to benefit most from the valuation skills and the weeding through the financial skills. And we'll talk about that first. Second, deal finding. If you're a group practice owner or desire to be a group practice owner, your ability to find practices for sale is going to be the hardest thing because the number of eight, you know, six to eight op practices. Yeah, exactly. So Alex just said it, group practices are out there. They just don't grow on trees. You got to go find them. And deal finding is your biggest key to success. So we'll talk about both of those things today. So how do we screen opportunities? Well, let's look at a couple. So if you've heard me do a webinar before, these are the same practices. I love these two. And here's why I love these two. Because there's a whole lot of Matt conversation going on in the chat right now, and I'm totally going to ignore it. Uh, I don't know what's going on over there, but I'm just going to leave it. So if you've heard me doing... <laughs> If you've heard me doing one of these webinars before, you'll know that these practices, so I got, I, I get a lot of, I used to get, and I still get a lot of practices sent to me. Hey, can you look at this? Hey, can you look at this? And I used to look at them for people. And so I got a lot of these practices in my email and I was sitting in class one day, this is back in dental school. And I got two practices on the same day, both seven ops, both priced around the same. And it was funny because the emails were totally different. And so these are the two practices. And I just absolutely love the fact that these two practices show what they do. So I'm going to go through them one more time and we'll start with practice number one. So this is, this is a fake listing, new practice listing, price to sell quickly. This GP office is established in the seventies. So it's like 30, 40 years old. It collects 1.15 million per year. The office has seven ops and it's asking price is 825. Second practice. Excellent opportunity, long-standing practice, revenue of eight, 869, seven ops, asking price 737. So ultimately, when I got these two emails, sample practice number one's buyer, right? He sent me, they're both in like average markets. I would say top 20 cities in the United States in terms of size, not any of the top five or six, but like, you know, biggest cities, nothing super saturated, but they're kind of on those like secondary markets. And sample practice number one said, hey, can you get back to me quickly? There's like three or four buyers about to like pull the trigger on this practice and I have to decide quickly what's going on. I got back to the guy like a week later, whoops, and it was already off the market. So this is like the super sought out practice that went for full price. Sample practice number two's buyer shot me an email and he said, hey, look, uh, you know, this practice has been for sale forever. Take your time. It's just sitting on the market. Nobody's interested. And uh, just let me know what you think. So that, that was the email I got from both of these guys. And let's take a look at them. You know, ultimately, Practice listings have like no information whatsoever. So sample practice number one. And by the way, I love that you guys are using the Q&A. I see all the questions in there. I'm going to get to them at the end. And then I'll be able to like click on them, like answered. And I, if I need to type an answer, I'll type an answer. It'll be pretty cool. Wait till the Q&A. It's going to be awesome. So anyway, sample practice number one. It's, so the reason it was so highly, or highly sought after was because it was doing over a million dollars, which makes them very desirable. However, it was only listed for 71% of collections. The reason why sample practice number two was not very desirable was because it does less than a million. However, it's listed for 85% of connect, uh, collections. So in general, practice number two appears to, on the surface, not be very attractive. And that's kind of how the market is responding to these. So let's take a look under the hood. I got both of these financials and I looked at them. Um, and here's kind of the things I looked at. So 
a percent of collections, if you haven't already kind of gathered from my tone, it's not a great way to look at a practice's value. That's how they're valued in the market. And so when we're looking at practices, we have this opportunity to find, we can avoid duds that everyone else is going for, and we can find diamonds in the rough based on the way that the market currently looks at it. So the market looks at, you know, the percent of collections as the way of valuing a practice. Whenever you value something different than the market, certain opportunities look great and other ones look terrible. And so we'll look at these two practices and we'll kind of look at them through that lens. But ultimately the way we look at practice value is how much cash flow does it kick off? And ultimately we look at the owner's income, especially for a solo, right? You are in the practice working as the dentist. So what is my expected income before I pay debt and taxes? That has a lot to do with how valuable that practice is because if you do nothing different and just keep everything the same, then you know what? I think you're doing pretty good. And let's see how much income you're making off of that practice. So we're going to go back to the sample practices and we're going to look under the hood and we're going to see sort of the financial situations. So let's start with sample practice number one. Its overhead is 80%. So if you know industry standards, that's high. Uh, the reason is because the fixed expenses are insanely high. Staff costs, high. Facility costs, super high. Like triple, almost triple what they should be. And this dentist, so this dentist owns this practice doing 1.15 million. He's taken home 227. The problem is after you pay your debt service on the, what was it, 825 asking price, you're actually, that's 127K a year of debt. You're left with 99K a year. So this buyer who actually emailed me was a high earning associate making like 180 grand a year as an associate. And he was like, okay, so I could buy this practice, have all the stress, do more dentistry and make less money. No, thanks. And I said, yeah, you're happy. You should be happy that it flew off the shelf because somebody else is making 99 grand a year working in this practice, not you. So, but again, this was the one that was much more desirable from a percent of collections standpoint. So let's look at the other situation, right? We have 870K in collections, overhead much less, 472. Staff costs in line, facility costs were a little high. And I left it here because the seller owned the building. And so when I looked at it, facility costs sort of sparked my eye, like what's going on? I shot him an email, what's going on with the building? And he said, seller owns building. I said, perfect. But then this guy, even with upcharging himself rent, still made 397. The debt because of a lower asking price is 102. This buyer who would pretty much be doing about the same number of procedures, same amount of dentistry, will go from making like 150 a year to 300K a year just by buying the right practice after debt before taxes. So when you look at the two side by side, you know, sample practice number two has tripled the take home of sample practice number one, similar asking prices. And ultimately it's all because of that net income multiple. So when we look at it differently and when we evaluate it differently, we're able to see a situation that the majority of the buyers in the market totally neglected. And that's ultimately because whenever you value something different than the rest of the market, you are going to come out ahead in certain situations if you pick the right practice, right? But then in certain situations, like sample practice number one, you know, one practice that is very desirable from the market standpoint is actually very undesirable from our standpoint. So let's move on to deal finding. And again, if you guys have questions about this, leave them in the Q&A. I see now we have 10 questions in the q and I'm excited for the Q&A. It's going to be a lot of fun. I love answering questions. It's like my favorite thing to do. So put the questions in the q and I'm going to move on to skill finding or deal finding. Because as I said, skill, it's the single skill that can separate successful buyers from unsuccessful buyers. It like hands down, the most important skill as a buyer to have, deal finding. If you're looking for a group practice, it is even more important. But if any practice is incredible, the more opportunities you have, the more you can screen using sample practice number one and two methods. I mean, you're better your chances of finding something spectacular. So everything starts with finding opportunities. So let me explain to you the two different ways that we find opportunities. There's off market and on market. So off market is going, you know, off the market, right? Some, the, the market is through brokers. So you have your local area. There's like six brokerages, maybe four to six brokerages in, that service your area. You contact them and say, hi, my name is Mr. Dentist, Mrs. Dentist. I'm looking to buy a practice and I want to see what's available. Here's what I'm looking for. And that's a very important thing is to mention what you're looking for to the broker. So if they don't know what you're looking for, then they're not going to think of you when they see anything. Off market is I'm contacting dentists directly to see if their practices are for sale. And there's a lot of benefits to off market and ultimately that's where the opportunity lies. So the goal with deal finding in general, right? Either working your brokers correctly, 
working your brokers makes them sound like, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, but anyway, I, I'm not a huge like broker person in general. I think there are, there are good apples and bad apples, but ultimately they, they try to dictate a lot of the process, which as a buyer, I don't love, but anyway, you got to work with your brokers, be the buyer that they want to be work with and try to find as many opportunities through them as possible. But then also you want to find as many off market deals as possible. And so this Richard's all caps, this is huge. You know, know what you want when you call brokers, great things can happen when you tell them exactly what you want. So anyway, now here's the difference. So when I contact a broker, right, we're starting on the left side of this column and I contact a broker and I say, hi, my name is George and I'm looking to buy a practice in Phoenix. Can you send me what you have that fits the correct number of operatories I want and the areas that I want? And then they're going to send me the financials and I'm going to run my numbers. I'll take a look. Is it cash flow? Does it have everything I need? How do the production reports look? I'm pretty much looking at this seller's practice totally naked. And I'm deciding, okay, once I decide I've seen this practice totally naked and I like what I see, then I meet the owner of the practice and I get to know them and maybe we work out a deal. You perf. Jeez. Well, it's, it's an analogy. Wait till you see the rest of the analogy, Richard. So now the other way around, off market, when you meet to get to know people, you don't first ask to see their most intimate financial documents. You get to know them first. So you, you meet the seller, you get to know them, you decide kind of together, I like the area, I like the number of operatories, I like everything that can be decided without a financial statement. And then you look at the financial statements. I think it's very important to understand this distinction because a lot of times, you know, it's like, People meet sellers like, hi, my name is George. How much does your practice collect? And uh, what's your overhead? And how much is your team expense? And it's like, first of all, these guys are typically not that in tune with their numbers to know that stuff. And second, it just comes across as like really abrasive. You know, you, it's, it, it's yeah, right. The analogy I'm using, like you're seeing the most intimate information they have. So Clay said it best. Don't ask to marry them on the first date. Get to know these guys, right? Try to build a genuine connection with these sellers. Now, how do you go off market, right? First, you need to determine what is your approach. So if I'm looking to buy a practice in a large area, I'm looking at five different states. The problem I have is not the number of practices available in five states. Like there's a good chance that there's a practice in five states that I could buy. The problem is how do I organize that much information? That's a lot of dentist practices to sort through. The opposite problem I have is in a small area is I don't have that many practices to pick from. Like for me, when I was looking to buy my practice, I was one third of Phoenix was my area. So you take a metro area, I'm like, okay, a third of it, that's where I'm willing to live. And that's where I'm going to buy. And so my problem was not that I didn't have, you know, and I wanted a group practice. So I have a super low volume of practices available. And so I had, to, I had to have an incredibly high response rate for the ones that were good fits for me. So I ultimately... I ultimately had to, in my practice that I bought, I had to call five times because I needed a very high response rate. I needed them to get back to me so I could see if they were interested. Versus if I'm looking in five states, there's no way in heck I'm going to contact the same dentist five times. That makes no sense. I'm going to send as many letters or postcards or whatever I'm going to do to as many dentists as possible. And just the rule of large numbers says that even though I get a low response rate, I'll have enough opportunities because I filtered through enough information. So ultimately, your off market approach depends on where you're willing to live and how big or how many practices that leaves you available to. And then we talked about it already, right? But closing the deal, interact with sellers like they're humans and get to know them as fellow dentists. And it's a crucial component of your off-market deals, your ability to connect with that seller on a personal level, your ability to get them to buy into, right? Who, what are, like, what is the psychology of this person? They are some person that is feeling guilty about the fact that they are retiring and moving on with their lives while their staff stay behind and work. And so they want to find somebody who essentially, I mean, I'm just going to call it what it is. They want to see a younger version of themselves. That's what they want to see. They want to see you and be, man, that reminds me of me and my wife back when we were like, however old you are. And ultimately you want to connect with that person and say, I am the child you never had to take over the practice. You know, I'm going to carry on your legacy. That's what you got to communicate to them. That's what they want to see. Your ability to do that is essential in your quest to ultimately be the person that they are giving their, this is the most prized possession they own. And ultimately your ability to be the person that they trust with that is incredibly important. I can't tell you, right? My sellers are not here, I'm assuming. Uh, I can't tell you how many things I felt like I just had to like swallow my pride, own it, and just suck it up and deal with a situation that I didn't want to, to preserve that relationship. 
it's my goal for the rest of my seller's lives. So when they think of me, they smile. And, you know, I, to date, I feel like I've done that, you know, but ultimately you have to do what's required to preserve that relationship. Now, let's talk about practice ownership. So national averages say that you are making as an associate $12,000 a month less than an owner. So that's just the typical averages. What we see with buying the right practice is that when we pulled people that have taken the, our ownership accelerator, people that we know who have bought practices, we've seen an extra on average 25 grand a month compared to their associate ship income. So we pulled income, our income of people pre-acquisition and post-acquisition and we kind of averaged them out. The new grads, we didn't count those as zeros. We just neglected them from the average of pre-acquisition income. And we found that the difference was about 25 grand a month. And those are the people that we know personally that, you know, and, um, you know, people that may be talking on this webinar are included in this potentially. And so ultimately, this works. Like we're not BSing people. This is a proven way to increase your income and lifestyle as a dentist, which is why I'm talking about it, right? That goes back to our mission to improve career income and satisfaction. Acquisitions do that. And so I'm going to ask you guys a question. Do you guys see the value of buying a practice in this buyer's market? Like, is that something that I've successfully communicated to you guys listening? Cool. I got a yes. I'll take my, okay, there we go. They're rolling in. So it's always been our mission at Shared Practices to maximize income and career satisfaction. That is something that we've been harping pretty much from day one. That is, you know, at least my reason for doing it. And so ultimately as a buyer, I'm going to talk about the ownership accelerator. We're running a sale right now, but ultimately regardless of the ownership accelerator or not, you have a choice and you can position yourself to capitalize on the situation. And you can look back at, man, you know, the coronavirus is a horrible thing that happened, you know, but I managed to make the most of it in my situation and buy a practice that I probably couldn't have bought otherwise. Or you could sort of give in to that fear, blame, and play conservatively, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, obviously, right, I'm, I'm advocating for choice one. That's why I'm here, because I just, I just feel like ultimately this is the best thing to do in your career. You, I, I just I can't imagine anybody doing this and telling me, man, George, I'm really pissed I bought a practice. I hate, I, I'm so mad at you for doing that webinar. It was a terrible idea. You know, you're going to be much happier. You're going to be making money. And you're going to be having autonomy. And so the Ownership Accelerator, it's our step-by-step -step course that we created to kind of guide people through the, uh, you know, acquisition process. We have special pricing right now for COVID until the end of the month. And I'm going to go through what's included in the Accelerator. And then I'll answer the Q&A questions. We got a lot, 16. I am excited for that Q&A. So what's included in the course? We have, so there's 80 videos in the course, a total of about 15 hours of lecture. Uh, you get lifetime access when you sign up for the course. So if you're a dental student, like we had the D1 earlier, said something, you know, they could refer back to it throughout dental school. And 12 sections, uh, deal finding, valuation spreadsheets, the anatomy of a deal, and a lot more, especially how to talk to sellers is something I really harp on in there. With it, we ship you a 250-page course manual. Uh, five to seven business days after you sign up and send me your address, you get the course manual. And ultimately, we include, so some of the things that we include to make the process easier for you is the Advanced Practice Financial Analysis Toolkit. So we have a customized spreadsheet that includes pretty much the format of a profit and loss statement where you just input things and then it, it really spits out practice information and valuations and everything like that. So you can very quickly look at a practice and screen it. And that typically costs like $1,000 a practice when you're doing this with professionals. The single site study toolkit. So one thing I did not talk about in the seminar is demographics, your ability to look at the local market and assess the competition and the importance of growth. You know, that's a really important thing that I normally talk about in a webinar. Uh, but I didn't today. And then your off-market search toolkit. So that's your ability to, we have like this Excel sheet that syncs up with Vistaprint so that you can very quickly and effectively make mailers to send to a lot of dentists quickly. And, uh, and then we talk about, you know, pockets of opportunity in that one as well, in, in addition to the single site study toolkit. And again, our price for the end of the month only, we have $1,000 off for associates and then the student pricing that we're offering. So at the, end of the, at the end of the webinar, when I'm going through the q and I'll leave a slide up. I'll let you know how to sign up. Um, but here's Ike. He's one of my buddies from dental school, current client of mine uh, for coaching. And he, he used the strategies we talked about. So he was one of the original uh, Accelerator students. And he found 50 off-market practices in my market in Phoenix. 
And that was just the biggest compliment that he could have ever given me. And so for me, you know, if practice ownership can be entered more quickly, is that worth it to you? You know, I think that's a question you need to ask yourself. And, you know, the national average says you increase your income by 12K a month. Is that worth it to you? You know, for me, the ownership accelerator, one of the biggest benefits, I, I see it as a buyer, is that you only pay professional fees for one practice. That's, that's my biggest reason. So it, we built it to save professional fees so that the cost of the course is you make it back and more in the savings, not even the getting into practice ownership faster, which is probably the largest benefit. And then if it gave you the tools you need to buy the right practice instead of the wrong practice, think back to sample practices number one and two, right? If the ownership accelerator give you what you need to know sample one versus sample two, would that be worth it to you? And that's a question you got to answer. You know, for me, it feels obvious. Uh, this is Holly. She took the ownership accelerator. It was critical to her in the process of finding an acquisition. And one of the big things we harp on is narrowing your focus. We kind of briefly talked about it with solo versus group, you know, where you want to live, what you want to own. And then you can filter through listings quickly and screen practices effectively. And so she found the practice she wanted, and then it lays out the steps on how to close the deal and what steps are followed and checklists and everything you need to get done. So you have two choices. I've gone through a lot. And ultimately, what you take away from it and where you end up because of it is up to you. So number one, you could give in to fear and be passive in your quest for practice ownership. That is your choice. Number two, is you could actively pursue practice ownership. Register for the ownership seller if you'd like and use our step-by-step -step process to help you maximize your success early in your career. And uh, we do have a 30-day guarantee. So for everything that we offer, we have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied or whatever, I don't think I've ever had to use this, to be honest. Um, we've been, we've been it's like two and a half years now we've been doing this. But anyway, um, so the real question is, I'll answer the Q&A in a second. I'm excited. I got 21 questions waiting for me. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to buy the right practice for you and reap all the rewards. And that's ultimately your decision. And, you know, I'll leave that guys up to you. It seems like we've had some people in the chat that have taken the course already. I'm happy you guys liked it. So now there's the information you need to sign up. I'm going to go through the Q&A. I'm pretty excited about this. So I'll start at the beginning. Uh, one of the first questions I was asked, and I'll work my way down to the bottom. If you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and I'll get it. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat as well. I see that somebody, you know, um, just ask something in the chat, but what were some of the main characteristics you looked at when you purchased your practice? So for me, I was looking for a group practice. So we talked about that, right? Multiple doctors. Actually, I was not looking for a group practice. I was looking to practice with my wife at the time, ex-wife now. And we, we were looking at like a, we wanted to potentially be there at the same time, but we wanted to have kind of a solo-ish thing. I think I kind of lucked out in the eight ops, to be honest. I, I, my initial plan was to make it a solo, like a really productive solo you know, but ultimately, you know, I think the number of operatories, the correct number of patients would be the things I really look for in a group practice. Those, you know, correct facility, correct number of patients, you know, one, two. So I'll, I'll, I'll count that answered and uh, I'm going to pronounce it Sapan. If, if I did not answer your question, then, um, you know, please follow up. So what do you think about buying the building as well with one practice versus buying two practices, assuming the same total purchase price? Well, that's a two completely different questions. So buying the building, so I'm answering this live. Buying the building is, you know, ultimately a separate decision, right? You got to look at the rent versus the, it's like buying a rental property. You're buying the rental property of your practice. And uh, typically it's a good idea to buy the building. And if, if you buy the building, I don't think that impacts two practices or one. I think those are two separate decisions, right? Two practices is like, do I want multiple practices? That's how you should answer that question. And then do I buy the building or not? Is, does the real estate make sense? Usually it does, not always, but usually it does. So I, I can't wait to buy my real estate. Oh my gosh. I'm like getting antsy about it, just talking about it. For those that live in a seller's market like Phoenix, um, due diligence phase, we have pushback closing, currently not negotiating the price point. The practice has six offers within a week of it's going on the market, really good practice in an area I like, but I don't want to walk into a bad dealer situation. Well, I mean, so if you've, if you've know the practice's financials, you can pretty much, I decide, do I want to buy it or not? And if you want to buy it, then you pretty much do whatever you have to do to get that practice. And if you don't want to buy it, then you, you don't buy it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, uh, I, 
I guess the number of offers on the table wouldn't bother me a whole lot. I feel like I should be able to quickly decide if I want to buy it or not. So I'm not super concerned about that one. If it's a good practice, buy it. And, um, you know, if it's not, then don't. I, I, I don't think the number of offers, I mean, you, if the practice is a good practice, you do whatever you can to get it. Number, number of offers are there, you know, that just means you have a little more urgency. But I think you should be able to filter through this pretty quickly. I don't think you should be like, see, I think people think that like, I need to think about it for a long time. Like, what are you thinking about? Like the practice financials are not changing. Uh, the situation is not changing. You know, nothing is changing. You know, it's a static. I think within a couple of days, you should decide or not if you could buy that practice. I, I think any more than two days, you're, you're stretching it too far. So um, maybe that's just me. I'm a super decisive person, but in general, that's what I think is best. So I used to recommend eight ops for a solo practice. So I think uh, six is kind of the number that can be both solo and group. Six is a stretch for a solo. That's a little bit too many ops. And six for a group is not enough ops. So that's kind of your baseline, right? And three, like don't even buy a three-op practice and tell me about it at least. If you're going to do it, just like do it in the closet and don't tell me uh, because I really don't want to hear about it. Uh, but four to six ops for a solo and then six to 10 for a group. So um, that's sort of what I'll say about the number of operatories. So would you just write off a practice for being a solo based on chairs, even if there's potential to grow in terms of internal or external growth? This is a great question. So Avinav, I, uh, whew, so I had this guy on, we were doing, uh, we're doing this new, this new segment uh, for the pursuit of ownership. And he said a three hygienist practice with four ops. And that piqued my interest, right? Because the two things you're looking for for a group practice are operatories and patients. And so they're both very, very hard to, ha hard to find. And having a practice with a lot of patients or a lot of operatories. And so I would want one of the other but I would really want operatories. It's really hard to move a practice. I would much rather, and I'm not saying I love the problem either, but I would much rather have the correct number of operatories and just have to generate the patient flow over time than I would not have the number of operatories or the patient flow. You know what I mean? Uh, but I, I mean, unless it's an insane number of patients fitting into a tiny practice, I would pretty much write off a, a, you know, anything less than six operatories uh, for a group. Yes. So that, hopefully that answers your question up enough. If you want a group, man, there's a lot of, you know, Richard was concerned and Richard is rightfully concerned. Uh, the more I open my mouth, the more group practice owners seem to be popping up out of the, the woodwork. So um, it's, uh, it's a bias that I have, I have created that I am not going to apologize for, uh, but it is definitely out there. So there's a lot of group practice questions here. I don't think I've ever done a webinar with this many group practice questions. It's awesome. So if you want a group, how do you feel about buying a well-run five to six op practice with two hygienists, maybe expanding, merging with another practice and trying to grow into a group? Uh, yeah, yeah, Richard. Okay, anyway. So I don't love the idea of buying a practice with the purpose of moving it, right? A two hygienist practice with five to six ops is not that hard to find. The hard practice to find is the one with eight to 10 ops with three hygienists. That's the, that's the one that, you know, like that's the one you want to find. And so it's like, why are we buying the five to six op practice with two hygienists is insufficient deal finding in my mind. That's how I look at it is we are giving ourselves a much harder situation of growing or moving or spending another 500 can at a different location because we are not good enough at deal finding. So Eric, my advice to you would be, I mean, I hate to say it, right, but go back to the drawing board and try to find that practice that better fits your long-term vision. Uh, because five to six ops in a group, you're, you're really doing gymnastics, like schedule gymnastics, evenings, all that stuff. And um, a lot of questions on the webinar are being recorded. I hate to say it. I forgot to record this thing. Um, <laughs> oh, no, it's just pause recording. Perfect. It's recording. Um, oh, cool. Good. Nice. I feel better. I, I realized that halfway and I'm like, I haven't been recording this the whole time. Whoops, but I was just going to roll with it. Um, how important is street visibility to an acquisition? Uh, about as important as new patient flow is. So if I'm buying a practice that has two hygienists and I plan on being a solo doc forever and two hygienists have enough patients, then I'm not super worried about my visibility. If I'm buying a practice with two hygienists and I want six hygienists in the future, then my visibility and my ability to gather new patients is incredibly important. So, you know, it's how important are new patients you know, then how many new patients are they currently getting, your, your visibility, all of those new patient related things are all very important if new patient flow is important to the plan. Any advice for people? Man, I'm like knocking out these questions. I've answered seven and in the process of answering seven, I've got 13 more. 
So we're, we're working our way backwards. So I'll hopefully get to the end of this list. Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying the Q&A. I love Q&A. So I'm happy that I have time for this. So any advice for people in the middle of an acquisition? I was set to close at the end of March, but decided to put everything on hold, a mandate restricting elective care. Yeah. So if you're in the middle of an acquisition, what you need to do is you need to make sure that patients are getting back into your office. So after, yeah, so we got two questions in a row about this. So I'm just going to sort of answer them together and mark them both as answered. And if you, if you are in the process of buying a practice, what you need to see is patients returning back to hygiene in your office, then you feel comfortable pulling the trigger. If you can maneuver a price discount in this process from the seller, right? Cool. That'd be nice. If you can't, then if it's the right practice, I'd probably still go with it, to be honest. Uh, but, um, you know, I would say that's typically how I would handle it. So two questions knocked out and one more added. So I'm, I'm working my way down. Our fixed ex staff, okay, um, expenses, additional to overhead costs. So our fixed expenses, staff and facility, additional to overhead costs. So no, fixed expenses are a subset of our total overhead. It, it, the reason I like those expenses and the reason why I look at them is because it's the, uh, you know, those are the, like, right, the building costs set in stone, literally. And the staff costs, you know, you don't want to either pay people less or fire people. That's, that's going to change a lot about things about the practice. So those are the hardest things to change, which is why we focus on them. But they are components of overhead. Who you use for supplies, lab, your legal fees, all that stuff is going to change once you take over. But your facility and staff costs are the two expenses that we can really much guarantee are going to stay the same. So that's why we harp on them. So how do you prefer to contact off-market sellers? Great question. So I like to write, so it depends. Small area, large area. Large area, right, you send everybody a postage and then you follow up over the phone if you really feel like you didn't get enough the first go around. Uh, but typically send everybody a letter, wait three weeks, see what happens. And then, you know, and the strategies work outside the US, of course, uh, because this is just buying a practice. I mean, the markets, the valuations and stuff, that's market specific. But I mean, the principles are all transferable to any country in the world. Um, actually, I'm actually impressed that we have, you know, there's been a few international comments. I, I, like, the, I like the diversity we have here in our chat. Um, but anyway, so you contact off-market sellers by essentially just contacting them, right? So if I'm going to call them, I'm going to say, hi, my name is George. I'm a dentist in the area and I want to get to know Dr. Blank. You know, that's all you say. And then if he does it, great. If not, then you call back. You say, hi, you know, I'm ultimately looking to, I called last week. I wanted to get to contact with him. He didn't get back to me. I'm calling back again. Can I get in contact with Dr. Blank? I want to ask him some questions about practicing in the area. Something, you know, unsuspecting. You're just trying to get to know the older dentist. Eventually, he's going to ask you your plans and you tell him, yeah, I'm planning on buying a practice, you know, and then he'll, if he's a seller, he'll let him, he'll, he'll make himself known. So those are the two ways you contact. So how many months after the stay at home or if there's a good way to determine dental practice back to work? Okay. COVID specific question. Was about to close on a practice, but now I feel this practice is not worth the same as it was pre-COVID. Okay, so this is exactly right. We've we've answered this question a couple times now. So, um, yeah, different bankers have different things. So I'm answering these two questions back to back. One's about banking related to COVID. Yeah, once start patients start going back, every bank has their comfort level. Some banks want to see production increase three six months of sustainable production. Some just need one month of sixty to seventy percent of what they were doing before. It is very bank specific. You know the bank that you use and yeah, right. Lendever is Lendever is the one bank I've talked to that will not require a hundred percent of collections to be returned. If they see the momentum working its way back up, they'll, they'll lend. So it just depends on the bank, but honestly, and your comfort level for me, I'm a risk taker in general, right? That's the thing I'm trying to communicate in this webinar is the value of potentially taking a risk, right? I'm not saying being dumb, but right. Like you want to, you really want to, be a little bit aggressive here. This is the time to be aggressive. If you want to lower the price, great. Maybe say, hey, look, I'm uncomfortable. Can we lower the price a little bit to make me more comfortable? My guess is they're probably going to say yes. But ultimately, you got to, you got to, you know, you're never going to have the 100% like certainty that this is going to work out, right? That's the whole thing of leaving the shore and not knowing where you're going, but that's where you go find the next ocean or whatever the thing is that that quote was talking about. So I answered those two questions. At what point would you consider a market too saturated uh, for you to look in that area? Only asking because I found offices outside my ideal location, more rural setting. Demographics are great. I'm leaning towards this office. Okay. So demographics. So really you, what we're asking is uh, 1,500 to one is a national average. So anything below 1,500 to one is, <laughs> sorry, I just read a funny comment. Anything uh, below 1,500 to one 
is below national average, or I think it's 1,600 to one, but anyway, below 1,500 to one runs national average and anything above that is better than average, right? So there's your average. So, you know, 500 to one, 1,000 to one, obviously below average and 2,000, 3,000 to one above average. And this is the dentist, the population ratio that we're talking about. So it, it really depends on, so the, the way you want to study, that's a great question. I think it's, uh, you know, just put in the chat. It's like, you're looking at the 50,000 people closest to your practice. So in some markets, that's five miles in some markets, that's one mile in some markets is two in my market. Phoenix is two. So, uh, it's just how important are new patients to your situation? If new patients are not super important to you, then the demographics don't really matter. If new patients are very important to your plans, then they matter. You know, it, it's very situation dependent. And so um, I'm, I'm going to answer your question with another question of how important are new patients to you? And that's how important your demographics are. So that does answer the question, even though it sounds like I'm not answering it. I promise. So a newer listener, um, are you seeing similar trends with COVID for specialty practices? I honestly have no idea about specialty practices. My guess is it's the same. I think in pretty much specialty, the, the, each specialty operates like its own market. It's very unusual. Like perio practices are like their own thing. Oral surgery, it's, you gotta, that's a very practice specific thing. But I imagine that these COVID related things are not affecting, they're affecting everyone equally. Endo would be the one exception because they've stayed open the whole time because they treat emergencies. And uh, they've done, yeah, endo demand is up. And OS, you're right, OS. But then they have a lot of elective surgeries they didn't do. So, you know, but ultimately, that's a very specialty specific question. But, you know, for the most part, we're all kind of being affected the similar matter. Um, do you recommend buying a practice in the next six months considering the economic instability and recession? Uh, that's kind of the whole point of the webinar. Uh, yes, I recommend um, buying a practice in the next six months. Yes. Very strong recommendation. I hopefully will buy a practice in the next six months myself. So uh, hopefully I'll join a lot of people on this webinar. Sorry, just joined. Uh, will there be a replay? I, I think so. I think we recorded. So that is a success. Um, when you approach a seller, I understand you need to not get to know uh, but you're still upfront with them. So yeah, the way that, so you are, so Luis, this is a good question. You are not interested in buying their practice. You're interested in buying a practice and theirs might be available, but they might have a friend who also has an available practice. So really it's not about that practice particularly. You want that older dentist to know that you are looking to buy a practice in the area so that whether his practice is available or her practice is available or their friends or someone they know, but it's not, it's, there's an indirect path to ownership, not through the specific person you're talking to. So you want that seller or older dentist to know that you are looking to buy a practice. What they do with that information, whether they offer their practice to you or whether they offer their friend's practice to you is, is you know, that's the random game of life that we play. But what you can control is making sure to communicate that to an, if you, if you communicate to 50 older dentists in a specific area that you are looking to buy a practice, there's a good chance that maybe 30 of them their practices might be potentially available and maybe they have like 10 different friends, you know, I don't know. So uh, those are not hard stats, but I'm just I'm making a point that there's, you know, you can't really control that, but you can control telling them your intentions. So you're an associate 2018 grad, fellow 2018 grad here, um, wanting to buy um, diamond, the rough practice. I'm working at for nine months, 80% of the practice. Um, yeah. And again, like the 80% uh, of collections thing, uh, is really not important, right? It's how much has a cash flow. If the if it's eighty percent and you make a lot of money and you're bought eighty percent for the practice, like like if you're if you're happy where you're at, you've been working there for nine months, you buy this practice that is you know uh, potentially um, you know not necessarily the best price per collections, but you're happy making a lot of money, low overhead, and it cash flows well, like, do you really care what percentage you, I, I mean, I honestly, if I didn't get asked all the time, I would forget what percentage I paid. I think I paid 81% for my practice. I mean, I don't care. It, it, that, that, I remember it was 3.3 times EBITDA or, you know, 1.6 times net income. I don't remember the actual percentage of collections. Like that's not a number I really should, should be remembered. So I would say if you're happy there and it cash flows 80%, especially if you're working there, like that's a no brainer. I would buy that practice in a heartbeat. Um, so yeah, Hannah, my, my advice to you would be buy the practice if it cash flows. So schedule the close on June 30th, agreed on a price pre COVID. How do you recommend approach situation? How do you renegotiate? Yes. Yeah, so I would approach them honestly, right? The more vulnerable you are, the better, right? So you say, I'm very scared about the prospect of buying a practice right now. I feel like the practice is going to do lower in its numbers because of COVID. 
So can we adjust valuation, right? Do I actually think that practices are going to have like this long-term dip because of COVID? No, I don't think that. I think that ultimately over time, we get back to where we were. That's typically what happens. And so, but you can communicate that concern in a very vulnerable, honest way to the seller. Look, we are both human and we're looking at the situation, you know, and, um, so, so I think I just answered the next two questions. How would I talk to sellers renegotiate, right? You'd be vulnerable and honest. Say, hey, look, the situation, I'm scared. Can we adjust the purchase price? Yes or no? And then if they say yes, we can adjust the purchase price, then you renegotiate. If they say no, then you got your answer. Uh, you know, I mean, there's no point in staying in the middle, right? You find out either yes or no. I love certainty. So uh, I answered the next two. Man, I have been going at these questions and I still have more than I started with. This, is, this, has, been, uh, this has been fun. I love Q&A. I hope you guys are enjoying this too. Um, so by participating, our, so, okay, so by participating in the ownership accelerator, what I'm implying is that you will save professional fees because what happens a lot of the times is people get a practice that is very obviously a terrible idea. Like it's either the, not the correct number of operatories. It is not the, uh, you know, ultimately like the cash flow, the staff costs are insane, something like that. So whenever we have an educated buyer, like I saw Sarah earlier comment, he did our group coaching program and he had like this direct impact, like he, perfect example of finding an off-market practice using our principles. I loved, I loved that comment. I didn't comment on it at the time, but you know, the, uh, so the whole point of it is that you can filter out a lot of this practice. So imagine if I sent a practice to a, a buyer's rep or an accountant or something, I said, Hey, can you look at this? Let me know what, let me know what you think. And then they're like, oh, well, you know what? It's uh, like, it doesn't cash flow. It's terrible practice. Like you definitely should not buy this. It's like, did you really need to pay a thousand dollars to find that out? If you take the ownership accelerator, you can find that out very quickly versus like, if you take the ownership accelerator and you can look at a practice and say, man, this looks really good. Like, I, I think I'm not missing anything. This looks great. Everything the course has taught me looks perfect. And, uh, you know, ultimately I, I want to see, I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. That's when you give it to the professional. So when we have educated buyers, when we educate them through our course and we've educated them through our interactive coaching that we used to do, they go like, it's impressive. Like, we have one of them on the pursuit of ownership coming up and you hear him talking. It's so impressive. He's like, I looked at the numbers. I looked at the associate costs and like, they're very educated. They do a lot of that process themselves. So they save a lot of professional fees. So that's how you save money. It's not by... Uh, not needing an account. You need an account but for one practice is the goal. The one that you buy, you pay all those fees, not like six. So due to the banks being more strict during this time, any recommendations or suggestions? Yeah. Decide what you want to do and then find a bank that'll do that with you. So there are banks out there that are more, the, the accelerator, you know, thanks, Sarah, or that's not Sarah, is it? It's Salil. Thank you. Anyway, um, the banks right now, it's a very differing very differing perspectives, right? Every bank has their own policies. So you find out what you want to do. Like for me, right? I want to buy a practice. My price point's around 2 million. So I want to, you know, set, I want that, that much money. So I find a bank that's going to give me that much money, right? The banks are not like all the same. It's very different. So find a bank that's willing to work with what you want. <laughs> Take the thank you too. <laughs> all right. So I've been listening to share practice for a few months now. Sorry, work with as always. I do see the crisis is a great opportunity. Okay, another COVID question. Um, scared of overpaying for the practice, not being able to dig myself out of it later. Okay. Um, all right. So, the, so, yeah, there's a lot of concerns, a lot of fear about the correct valuation, right? So, let's look at this. Like, this is a little bit of coaching that I'm going to do with like 100 and whatever people are on this thing. So, there's two ways we can look at it, right? We can be overly concerned about the valuation. I could talk about nitpicking the valuation or what's the real problem here is the lack of un the uncertainty, right? This is, un we are asking you, or we are, we're not asking, I don't care if you do this or not, but like we are telling you it might be in your best interest to enter a period of uncertainty for the purpose of your future. Lean into that, right? So do I know for a hundred percent certainty that valuations are, or like the practice is going to return to a hundred or 105 or 110% of pre COVID numbers? No, I don't know that. Of course not. But, you know, ultimately you got to lean into the uncertainty and you got to say, look, I'm taking a risk and I'm betting on myself that I can grow this practice back to what it was doing, if not more. And COVID created the opportunity for me to enter practice ownership earlier than I would have otherwise. That's what COVID is offering. Yes, there's uncertainty. Of course, right? I can't tell you with a crystal ball that like, th nobody has any certainty about COVID. That's like the whole point of this whole thing. You know, so ultimately 
yeah, you got to lean into there's going to be uncertainty. That is part of the buying a practice during COVID, right? And that's, that's what I'm saying. If you, that is too uncomfortable for you where you can't do it, then you're playing a conservative. And that's fine. That's a very respectable thing to do. Um, but the opportunity lies in the discomfort. And the opportunity lies in leaning into that and getting a practice you might not have been able to get otherwise in a timeline that might not have been able to fit your timeline otherwise. And that's the thing that um, you know, I, I really want to advocate for. So do I see the future leaning towards group practices? Um, honestly, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pronounce it Tanner, even though it's spelled like Tanor. Uh, but Tanner, I honestly, I don't, I'm not like a political person. Um, you know, I don't like the future of dentistry is not something that really um, gets me moving. Not something I really concern myself with. So do I see it leaning towards group practice? I genuinely probably, but do I see many, many solos making it work? hundred percent. So what do group practices do well is, you know, infrastructure, systems, organization, management, scalability. What do solos do well? Relationships with patients. As a group practice owner, I can never replace going to a dentist and seeing the same dentist every time. Some patients like that. Do I think it's the future? I mean, sure. But there is a very great place for a solo dentist. And, and I, I, I think that's like the part that we're trying to like, right, I've created a group bias. Like I think the comments are just like illustrating that to a T. But solo is the easiest way to make money in dentistry is being a solo dentist, right? It just doesn't fit my personality. And it doesn't fit the way I like to do things. And it doesn't fit who I am. So I don't talk about it a whole lot. But like Matt, you know, he, he is he kind of like the, you know, very productive, great solo. So, you know, yes, I see group practice have, just, they're, they're, they're like, apples and oranges. I, I don't think they're like, it's not like the world's all of a sudden going to stop eating a certain type of fruit. Like, you know, maybe one might be a little more prevalent in the future, but there's always a place for both. And so I almost think answering this question and saying it's leaning towards group is creating a false idea that, um, you know, that's, I guess, not really out there. So uh, what are options for someone who worked at associate for a year and only produced 400K due lack of patience, not lack of speed? Banks obviously look at this unfavorably. So again, anytime we talk about banks, it's Find a practice first, then find a bank that will do what you want. Banks are a commodity. It's money. It's money at an interest rate, right? And like, I like Lendever and I love Lendever because those people are awesome. They have the best process, great rates, a lot of money, and they make the process the smoothest. But ultimately, if Lendever didn't get me what I was wanting, I would go to another bank. And that's uh, banks. Money is money. You need money. And so, like, so here's the thing. If anybody's scared that they're not producing enough as an associate, it's ultimately, that doesn't matter because, I mean, a lot of times associate production doesn't transfer to ownership production because like, like this person said, right, they don't have enough patients, right? But your skill sets transfer. So if you do endo, oral surgery, implants, and you're not producing a lot as an associate, that's because you're in the wrong practice, not because you got the wrong skill set. Um, and obviously there is a level of productivity, your ability to communicate with patients, but I, you're an associate producing 400 K a year tells me nothing about their productivity. That's just a flawed system that the banks have. Um, but again, find a bank that will do what you want. If you've never thought about additional office until recently, do you think it would still be a good time to look into offices or wait until the main office rebounds to where it was pre COVID then continue looking? So it's a good question. Anonymous attendee. I'm in the same situation. So I think at this point, right? Like, my state board said we're going back May 4th or May 1st or whatever. So like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it takes a few months to buy a practice anyway. Like I don't, I, I think if, if you're, if you're posting this comment, my guess is that if you started looking and buying a practice right now, by the time that practice closed, you'd probably be pretty close to pre COVID numbers is my guess. So I don't know. I'm, I, yeah, I, I think you should be like having cash flow, right? You shouldn't buy another practice if you're not making any money in your first practice. That's probably just generally a good idea. Um, but I think the timelines of those are not as far as you might think. I wouldn't wait till I have my cash flow back and like my practice is 100% pre-COVID numbers before I started looking. I would just like want to see it like before closing would be nice, but I, mean, I don't know. What's the best way to calculate the actual patient number? Is it number of profies, perimenuses, schedule divided by two? No, it is not that, Eric. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a tough one because uh, active patients is a number that we like. I like that number. The problem is that no practices actually 
give it to you. So we look at hygiene percentage as a way to judge that, right? If the hygiene percentage is high, that means for the relative production of the practice, there's an excess of patients. If the hygiene percentage is low, that means for the relative production of the practice, the patient flow is low. So if a practice has 15% hygiene, I'm looking at that as not a lot of patients considering its production. If the practice has 35% hygiene, I'm like, okay, that's got a lot of patients for its production. So I think it's much more uh, hygiene percentage based because, right, a lot of patients get one cleaning a year because they're lazy and they don't reappoint or whatever. Like, I, I don't know. Um, but ultimately, that's not a good, that is not. So I look at their new patient flow too. If they've been sustainably getting a lot of new patients, you're probably going to have, you know, a lot of inactive patients. Um, so I, that's the problem with buying a practice is you can't really tell exactly uh, what, you know, we're looking at. So what do you think about the mid Florida market? I have no idea about any specific market, not even the Phoenix market. Um, I don't know. Uh, I have, yeah, no market specific information. I'm sorry. Um, I apologize. Uh, this might be a little off topic as of right now, but how can you look at, okay, how long should we wait until looking at real estate investments? I honestly, I, you know, Tan, this is a great question. Um, post COVID I meant Cool, Tan. Um, so, you know, ultimately real estate is right. So, um, the, the real estate market typically is going to be the last thing to dip. I mean, that's just what we've seen historically. So, I mean, honestly with real estate, like this is, this is not a real estate. I am not a real estate expert. I, this is just my personal knowledge. If somebody's interested in real estate, you typically want to invest at whatever point it cash flows. So if it cash flows now, invest now, if it cash flows later, invest later. Um, Real estate's hard to time markets. That's a pretty risky game to play. So relying on cash flow and making decisions that way is typically a better idea. So um, I don't know. I mean, whenever your local market cash flows is when I would invest. And when it cash flows, it's pretty much your personal requirements for investing in a deal. Um, I'm not, you know, ultimately the, I'm not the real estate expert, but that, that'd be my say on that. Um, you said this is a buyer's market in the past podcast. Many people stated to not look for practices for a lower price to make the seller upset. Uh, would you now change your recommendation? That's a good question. So, um, no, I still would not negotiate on price a ton, you know, maybe a little bit right now. You could say like, I'm a little nervous about the price. Just like come at it from a more vulnerable place. Like you have a vulnerable place now to come from. I think before we never had that. We never had like the, I'm concerned about the future prognosis of dentistry concern, like really valuable, vulnerable concern. So I think you can come at it a little differently. Um, but in general, right. I still, I think the biggest benefit of COVID is not price being decreased. It's the number of practices available increasing and the number of buyers decreasing. So your chance to walk into the right practice is increased. So again, that's the big benefit in my mind, not the uh, price of the practice itself. Man, you guys are, I mean, I, I, I still got a lot of people here. I still got a ton of questions. I'm enjoying this. Hopefully you guys are too. Well, I think you guys are too, because I've answered 32 questions now. I started with 34 and I got 37 left. So uh, this has been a lot of fun. I'm going to keep going. How do you feel about a practice that needs a lot of updates, investments? Where do you draw the line on that? Um, you know, Robbie, I bought a practice that didn't have a whole lot of technology or anything, and it had cash flow and patience, and that's the most important thing to me. So I don't know. I kind of I kind of like that philosophy. If it cash flows, then you can pay for that stuff. And typically, so right, how do the how do brokers value practices? They typically discount based on that stuff, right? Dentists they don't want to walk into like a 1980s office, so it's going to cost less. So typically, you're getting a discount on those practices. I honestly, it's cash flow, patience, one, two, and um, you know. I would go, I would go with those. And if, if, I mean, draw the line, like, right. Paper charts would be a really annoying thing to deal with, but I'd probably deal with it for the right practice. Um, but ultimately I would, I would not draw a firm line in the sand. I'd look at the opportunity holistically and decide if it's something I want to deal with. So you cannot wait to buy your practice location. Uh, how are you guaranteed it'll be sold to you at a fair price, avoid getting rent gouged <laughs> while working there. Um, so I have a, I mean, this is like deal specific information that you're getting inside to my contracts, um, but I have a buy option. So I, I approach them, right? This is so, this is one, this is a good example, right? Let's talk about the building. So I approached them. I said, hi, my name is George. I want to buy your practice. I mean, not like that. Right. But once we got there and I said, well, I want to own the building as well. If you own the building, I want to own it. I don't want my seller being my landlord. That's pretty much in other words, what I told them. I said, that's kind of important to me. They said, well, um, that wouldn't work for us because we are in our late fifties and I want to ultimately, you know, have, the ability to collect rent until I collect social security. So we negotiated a buy option. When they get social security, I own the building. 
I mean, it's seven years. I've been in it two years now. So I got five years left. I'm going to probably try to strong arm them in a couple of years. We'll see. But um, nonetheless, that's my situation. And um, it's a fair appraisal, right? That's in the contract. So I see you said thank you. So it seems like I answered your question. What if sellers are reluctant to reevaluate? Yeah, I mean, then you decide, do I still want to buy it? Am I willing to take that risk? And, um, you know, again, I'm not super worried about price. I mean, in general, right? Like if you're happy making money, a practice owner, owning your, the right practice for you and it's fulfilling everything that you want it to do in life. And then like, if you're still upset about the price you pay for the practice, you probably have other things in your life that are coming up. My guess is that if you're like a, you know, if, if that's right, I'm not saying that that's bad, right? Like everyone has stuff, but I'm just saying like the price you paid for the practice, it's more of an emotional thing than it is like a financial thing. It's like very, very little amount of money every month. So I wouldn't be super concerned about it. Um, Phoenix sellers market six offers. I didn't mean to ask, should I buy it or not? I made the decision to purchase the practice based upon file knowledge. I did the ownership accelerator twice. Um, I have my offer accepted four days before the country went on lockdown. I'm wondering now with it being a Myers market. No, I, I would not. If you are happy with the practice you were looking at and uh, you were totally on board for buying that practice, then I would not change plans. I would buy that practice and I would, you know, right. If you get a discount, great. If not, then you know what it, you don't have to like max ring the because what if you leave this practice to go take advantage of the buyer's market and then you don't find anything better and that practice is gone i would i would not i would not um, this is a this is a seller and this is a buyer in phoenix looking to buy a practice in four days like pm me we should go have dinner or something like i mean there's not a lot of you know i mean phoenix is fun it's a lot of stuff to do once this thing opens up again anyway um so yeah, I would still buy the practice. I would not go take advantage of the market. If, if it was a good practice in the first place, then you already, um, I, 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 you know, I think people don't want to overpay. I, I get the desire to not overpay, uh, but what's more important, right? Getting in the right ownership situation is the most important. It's like objective number one is getting in the ownership situation. At that point, it's just a, it, financially overpaying versus not overpaying typically is not like a huge deal. It's like on a monthly basis, could be like $500 a right. So $500 a month. So yeah, so this guy's acquired three practices, difference in loan payments. Yeah, see, exactly. It's like $500 a month difference. You know, it, it's a very emotional, uh, the desire to not overpay. Uh, what are your thoughts on purchasing a practice, but not having, to, but having to relocate? I do not relocate. I do not like relocating the office. Um, that sounds like buying two practices and getting one, right? You're paying for the practice and then you're paying to relocate. Um, I do not like that. Unless it's a spectacular situation, like, Amazing. I, I do not like that idea. Um, to recommend going with a local lender, if you want to buy right now, uh, it seems big banks may require um, to see how the practice performs after it opens up. Um, yeah, I mean, every lender has their own requirements. So I would just talk to as many as you can. I mean, banks are commodities. Like they are not, I mean, as much as I like one particular bank, I mean, they're all, the reason I like them is because they do it the best. But other banks can get you money too. I mean, I would talk to a lender. I'd talk to, you know, I mean, I would not talk to B of A personally, but you know, whatever. Um, anyway. Yeah. So it's just talking to find the practice you want. So I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this again, find the practice you want and then find a bank that'll help you get that practice. Like, yeah. If you're in the middle of buying right now, pre COVID LOI signed, what would you want to do in terms of possible? I think I've answered this question now. If you feel like I haven't asked it again, but I'm pretty sure I've answered the renegotiation of a pre COVID purchase um, already. So I'm just going to move on. I was looking at a long-term investment, um, at retirement. Uh, okay. So one practice. Okay. I think a practice would appreciate it. Hold on. So I was looking at a long-term investment at retirement, sell one practice plus real estate for X versus the profit per year over time and the final sale of two practices for X. I think a practice would appreciate and could be sold for more. I think it's generating profit per year as well. I'm curious to see what the potential is between these two scenarios. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So um, you're looking at like the investment versus of owning your practice and your building versus two practices. I still don't, honestly... If your building is available, I mean, you could own two practices and one building or um, I honestly don't know. I'd have to like see a specific situation, but in general, I don't think I, 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 I still stand by the, the claim that it's funny. I'm starting to get like follow-ups to my initial answering this question. Um, if I'm answering your question and I'm not doing it in the way that you want, throw it in the chat. I'm seeing that live. Um, but anyway, if so, still, I still stand by the, uh, the initial answer of, you know, running two practices is very different than running one. 
So if you're willing to run two, then there's a lot of financial benefits. If you're willing to run two and own real estate in either of them, that's great. Um, but comparing like one practice with real estate to two practices, no real estate, I, I can't, I don't know. Um, my guess is it comes out, you know, probably two practices will come out ahead. It's my guess, but I don't know for sure. It depends on where the real estate is, the part of the country. I, I have no idea. Um, I would, I would generally try to own the real estate of as many practices as I want. And if I could sell them and continue to own the real estate, that'd be great. Right. If I could own two practices, how, why not bank of America? Um, oof. okay. So if I could, if I could own two, um, two practices and the real estate and sell the practices and own the real estate continually, that'd be great. Right. That'd be the best possible situation. Um, people are talking about considering every practice a startup after, yeah. Um, I'm guessing those are the people on the Facebook groups that I talked about at the beginning that are considering all practices a startup post COVID. Um, yeah, I, I don't see that happening, right? These people have their dentists. They just didn't go for a couple months. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I think that, yeah, I think practices will return to similar to what they were doing before. I mean, yeah. Um, 50, 50 partnership for nine ops versus solo owner of five ops, right? Those are two completely different situations. And Hoda, I saw you commenting earlier about the cash flow with the Canadian market and, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, I've seen people buy practices in Canada successfully. You know, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, ultimately when we're looking at partnership versus ownership, it's how much money am I making and how hard am I working and what problems do I want to have? Right. If I'm in a partnership, I have less autonomy. I have uh, potentially the same income and I have debt, right? So how much debt am I taking on? How much am I going to make and what problems am I going to have? Am I going to deal with you know, somebody else have lifestyle benefits, right? And then ownership, solo ownership of a five op practice is different problems, different potential amount of money, different amount of debt. So I would look at it, try to look at them as, right? Try to make it as apples to apples as possible. Say, which problems do I want to have, right? This is, everyone will have problems in life. You pick your problems. And so pick the problems you want. The nine op partnership has problems. A lack, I, I personally could not do the lack of autonomy. I, that is something I've learned about myself. I need the ability to make decisions freely, uh, based on what I think is best. And so the partnership thing for me in the ownership of a practice, right? I know a partners and shared practices is a little bit different, um, but it also comes up. So, you know, solo owner of a five-op practice for me was more appealing because, you know, I, I make all the decisions. That's like the most important thing to me. But maybe you like, you know, I'm kind of passive. I don't care what, you know, type of marketing we do or how we answer the phones or all that stuff. Then cool. Then you go with an INOP partnership. I mean, it's just what problems you want. Um, I think you can make the same amount of money in both. I think same, similar amounts of debt, you know, I see a thanks, so I'll move on. Okay, how about a chair, seven chairs doing two million, multiple specialist associates, staff, one concern, still being able to run the business as well as the seller. So you want to run the business as well as a seller and sell dentistry as well. Okay, cool. So this is, I, I love this question, Matt. This is my favorite question so far. $2 million practice, seven chairs, and you're wondering if you can run it as well as a seller. So when we're looking at a large practice or any practice of that matter, we want to see how well are they doing. Let's look at their hygiene percentage. Let's look at their fluoride percentage. Let's look at their perio. Let's see how well they're doing. What's their crown to filling ratio? Like all these things that we look at when we analyze a practice. And then you can see how well is the seller running their practice. I have looked at $2 million practices where I'm like, if I walked into this thing, they'd be doing three in six months. Like the idea that a seller is good at what they do because they own a $2 million practice. I get that there's multiple specialists. So you think that like, okay, but a lot of these systems are already in place. Like the, the idea that it's too big, honestly, the larger the practice, the more stable it is, the less it's going to get affected by a single change. So honestly, the practice that I see dip the most are the solo practice that's doing like 1.1 million, 1.2 million with a single hygienist. Like that's a seller that's cranking. And right, we talked about it, like solo success is based on the dentist. And walking into that practice, you're going to see a dip if you're not that kind of cranking dentist. But a group practice with doing 2 million with specialist associates, all that stuff, like that's stable. Like, look at the seller. I mean, are you doing anything special? Or do I just have to like treat the office manager well and kind of keep things going the way they are? And I want to see how much the hygiene percentage is, right? If it's like doing two mil and hygiene is like 20%, then I'm like, yeah, I'm not loving that practice. But if it's like in the mid thirties, I'm like, yeah, I could grow that thing. So again, let's look at in our valuation process, how, like, let's not just judge based on how large the practice is that is really well run on any size, right? And any size practice, let's not assume how well it's run. Let's look and figure out how well it's run. Um, do I think buying a fee for service practice is more risky due to potential loss of goodwill? Yes. That's just a fact. Like that's not, I am biased, right? Like I've, I think I've addressed that enough times now. I have biases. Um, I prefer insurance based 
practice just because of my model of having other dentists see patients and all that stuff works better with insurance. Um, but fee for service has a lot of benefits, a ton of benefits. Um, but yes, they, they are, it is, it is a more volatile transition. Yes. You have to figure out what are they doing that allows them to be fee for service and can I continue to do those things? You know, but yes, it is a more risky transition. Brokers usually represent the seller. Dual represent, okay, so dual representation. Um, so the key asked a great question. And that is, I don't know if this is the key I know or another one, but um, brokers usually represent the seller. Correct. If they're a dual representation broker, broker, they still represent the seller. They just charge the buyer as well. I mean, that's just what I'm saying, right? They technically, I mean, technically both the broker, every broker, whether the dual representation or not, works with both sellers and buyers, but they always have, it's the key I know. Cool. Nice to talk to you, man. Um, but anyway, it's the, it, they always represent both to an extent, but they always have the best, the seller's best interest in mind. That is their client. So dual representation is just a fancy way to f charge both people. Um, I'm not against it, right? I don't agree with the philosophy, but hey, if they have the right practice and they want to charge me 15 grand to buy it, cool. I'll pay it. I'll buy the practice and I'll move on with my life. Um, I mean, I think people sometimes get too caught up in the, the like, that's not right or you can't represent two people. Like, who cares? If it's the right practice, then I'm going to buy it. Um, for new grads, interested in practice ownership in one to two years, a joiner practice and associate dentist where you can make 300K and save finances, joiner practice where you can learn more new procedures interested in doing. Um, so honestly, um, I'm going to answer this question with a question. So Olga asked, if you're looking to buy, be an associate pre-ownership, are you looking for the practice where you can make the most money as an associate? Or are you looking for the practice where you can learn the most procedures? And I would flip the question on you and say, are you going to be a solo owner or a group owner? And if you're going to be a solo owner, then maybe those procedures you learn are going to be valuable. What type of demographic do you want to serve? Like implant placement, Invisalign, Botox, are you wanting to be in a higher end market? Or are you wanting to like, you know, what kind of practice? So start with the end in mind and say, I want to own the practice that requires these skills of me. And then find an associateship that potentially gives you those skills. So obviously, right, making a lot of money, saving finances for practice acquisitions isn't super relevant, right? That's not really a thing like banks. I mean, they like to see some level of liquidity, but I mean, they, they're, they're working with dentists. Like, I mean, there's, I, I don't think 300K is going to really put you in a better financial position to buy a practice than 150K. Um, it'll make you in a better financial position in your life, but it won't really affect uh, practice acquisition a whole lot. I think the skills of a dentist being very productive, right? If you make 300K, you're probably doing a million. So, you know, the skills that you acquire doing a million are valuable. Um, the Im implant placement, Invisalign, Botox may be valuable, maybe not. I mean, I would say that, I don't know. I mean, it just depends on your goals. And I mean, again, it's hard to answer these questions sometimes when I don't know that stuff. Uh, but if you're, if you're looking for, you know, a different type of practice where you might need to do some niche procedures, working in like a cosmetic environment where you communicate with those patients could be valuable. I would work in an associateship that is leading you towards your long-term goals. So understanding your long-term goal first and picking the associate strategically to fill in gaps that you have between your education, your residency, if you did one or not. And then, um, yeah, so we have Hoda here who regretted going for skill and not money or going for money and not skill. I, I also, I bought out of school and I, I definitely did not get skills that I would have had otherwise. Um, how can I assess my ability to reproduce a seller's production? So uh, two, yeah, two things. So um, your ability to reproduce is a lot to do with the hygiene percentage and your clinical skill sets. So are you, if you're subtracting procedures from the practice, that's a really bad sign that you, you know, um, so if I can do molar endo, like, you know what you can do, right? Patient comes in needing molar endo. Am I doing it or not? And so if they do molar endo and I don't, then I'm not going to reproduce that. But like the hygiene percentage kind of tells you what you need to know. If that seller is 15% hygiene, I don't care what procedures you're doing. That's going to be hard to reproduce. If they're doing 35% hygiene and you're going to do like my practice, they were doing like 36, 7% hygiene and they did surgical extractions, which I did not do. I didn't super care because they didn't do that many. And it, it honestly didn't, like I, I knew I'd grow the practice other ways and I'd compensate for that because it wasn't a large amount of production. So I think you have to look at the specific situation, your specific skills. If you're a graduating D4, uh, my guess is you probably don't know <laughs> what you do and don't do either. And so I'd, 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 uh, I'd assess your risk tolerance. Mine was pretty low clinically, right? I'm a, I'm a risk taker business wise, but clinically I'm like very conservative. So um, that's, that's my own stuff. Anyway, do you anticipate fee-for-service practice suffering valuations too? Um, 
I mean, I see them being potentially a little more affected than everyone else, but I don't know. I'm not like a big doom and gloom person in general. I'm not super concerned about really either of the practice. I mean, if you go on Facebook, man, you'll get worried, but um, I don't. And so I just kind of talk to people and look at the market and I don't let other dentists opinions affect mine. Um, so no, I'm not super worried about fever service either. I mean, I don't love the model, but I think it'll be fine. It'll always exist. Um, what do you, okay. What do you think about somebody using dental whale to find a practice versus DIY deal finding? Um, I'm not going to comment on uh, dental whale. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know much about them. I mean, I, I know, who, you know, the situation I'm just not going to, um, but a service versus DIY deal finding, right? A service, potentially you could find more um, deals, potentially DIY deal finding, more work, less money. So it's like, do I want to pay somebody? I, I don't know however much they charge to find something for me or not. I don't know. Um, personally, I prefer to do it myself, more control over the process. I can like, if you really want to find something, I can put in a ton of effort. Um, Dental Whale or any other company that does this, they have like these, you know, headhunters that find these practices for people, you know, they're, how much work are they going to put in? What are they going to do? I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much they cost. Um, definitely not going to comment on a specific company. Um, but I'm not upset that you asked the question. The great question, right? Do I pay somebody to do it or do I do it myself? It's your personality, right? Do you have however much they charge to, to spend on this? If not, then do it yourself and really crank it and, you know, put a lot of energy into it. Um, I agree to an ASCII price in January. Fee-for-service office, affluent area. Should price be negotiated? Potential earnout discussed. Um, okay. So transition is set for July. So again, same question. Go to them vulnerably. Tell them I'm concerned. Fee for service practice, a little bit more volatile and COVID. Like a lot of things are not working in my favor here. I'm concerned. Are you willing to discount or are we willing to renegotiate price? This was pre-COVID. This is now post-COVID. Are you willing to negotiate price? Just ask that question. I'm concerned. Are you willing to renegotiate price? If they say yes, then you renegotiate price is something you're comfortable with. If they say no, then you, you make the decision now. Am I still willing to buy it or not? So uh, I, I think I hopefully, you know, I like the fact that I'm repeating that answer because it, it's coming up a lot and hopefully it, um, so I'm graduating next year in May. Can I start looking at for practice? Uh, so uh, can I still start looking for practices? Uh, typically they want you to be six months away from walking into the practice before you start looking. So whether that's a resident or a new grad or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, I will say this, Tyler Tolbert, if he is still here, um, I, I want to say, so I bought a practice out of school and Tyler, if you're here, comment in the chat, but you know, I, I have, we have three interns at share practice, Clay, Aaron, Tyler, and you know, none of them as it appears, right. I don't know for certain, but I don't think any of them are going to buy a practice out of school. And as somebody who did that and like these three people that I've been mentoring for like two plus years, don't buy a practice out of school. Like, you know, that, that like, you know, I was like, okay, that's, um, I was hoping that they would, but the reality is it might not be the best move for a lot of people. He, he's like, you know what, George, I want to be a group practice owner and I want to be able to buy a larger practice than the one that I could buy out of school. And so I'm going to work for a year, get some skills and then buy a $2 million practice, for example, instead of a, you know, smaller practice. And so for me, Oh, I remember Tyler said he had to leave. Um, but anyway, so anyway, yes, I would, I would reevaluate the decision to buy a practice out of school. But if you're still going to do it, then I would start looking six months before you can start working. Asking price, 100% of collections for 2019, 1.8% of 1.8 times profit, office is 50% overhead. Um, I don't know what we're talking about, but again, like the, the percentage of collections doesn't matter to me like at all. The 1.8 times profit sounds good. Upper end of normal. Sounds great. 50% overhead. I would like to own a practice with 50% overhead. So, right. If you look at how much, so then I would pretty much ask myself, how much am I going to make owning that practice? And that's what I pay. Right. So if it's 1.8 times profit, that means if collections are high, that means I'm making a lot of money. So I'm pretty happy. Um, again, the percent of collections doesn't matter. How do I watch the recording? Um, Matt, if you could answer that in the comments, um, I, I honestly didn't even know it was recording. So the fact that we have a recording to me is like, <laughs> playing with house money at this point, how you watch it. Uh, I'll leave that up to Matt. Um, this is a bit off topic, but can you guys talk more about partnerships at some point pros cons? Um, he'll get the recording sent out. All right. So you'll get it in email, I guess. Um, <laughs> a bit off topic partnerships. Okay. Partnerships. So I would try to look at partnerships the same way I look at ownership. How much am I making? How much am I working? What problems do I have? How much debt am I taking on? So 
honestly, I don't love talking about partnerships a whole lot because they're so situation specific and they're so deal specific. It's hard to like generalize. We've talked about them a little bit on the podcast. Like, I mean, a little bit like an episode maybe or two. Um, it's just honestly, I don't know. It's not a super exciting thing to me. I feel like their partnerships are so different. Some are glorified associateships. Some are true partnerships. Some are great deals. Some are not great deals. I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, um, I'm just going to move on from that question. I think the, the way I'll answer it is look at partnership the same way I look at ownership. How much debt am I taking on? How much am I making? And what problems do I have? And in its entirety, do I want that situation? If a practice is producing 700K off of a major highway, real estate for sale too, but only has three chairs, would you still buy it after overhead take home is 300K? So if the real estate is for sale, I would look at, can I add to the building? If I can add to the facility, I would take it. Potentially, right? Sounds like a good deal. Make 300K. If I can grow the thing to a million, I'm making good money. Uh, three chairs, cool. Yeah, if I can add to the facility easily, right? Not gonna have to like, do anything super gymnastics. Then, then yeah, I would take that practice. Because you could potentially grow, you know, like that. Yeah, I mean, the flexibility of owning the real estate and potentially being able to add to it, uh, I would consider that uh, takeable. Hopefully that answered your question. Tips for D1s and dental students trying to get ahead on learning everything on running a practice. Um, so you're talking to a guy that spent probably for reasons that were unhealthy, uh, like over a thousand hours learning how to run a dental practice in dental school. Um, and then I got there and I felt like a lot of the time was wasted and um, I probably didn't need to spend that much time. I think spending more time getting into ownership and maybe taking the business master's course that Breakaway offers would be sufficient for me pre-ownership. I hate to say that, right? But like, you need to learn how to study analytics and you need to, this is like a totally ownership related question, but you need to know your analytics. You need to know your goals, your vision and how to get there and then solve the problems along the way. So I would, I would just do, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about learning to run a practice before owning a practice. I, I'll put it that way, right? Really, this question is coming from somebody that has some fear around not wanting to own a practice until they know kind of, or at least that's where mine came from. I wanted to know everything before I walked in. I wanted that certainty. And the reality is you're never going to know until you get started. Um, so, yeah. But I have Business Master's great course. Um, email is going to, Matt said he's going to send an email with the recording. I'm knocking through these questions now. I got almost 60 answered, 27 left. I offered uh, the doctor a purchase price. Mine is 100K due to COVID-19. Offered to give up, give the 100K in 24 months if I reach a production. That's a great, okay, doctor isn't happy about it. And <laughs> wants to sell the practice for the price we agreed on. How would you approach this? Yeah, so. Um, I mean, how much do you want the practice? How great of a deal is it? And how much risk are you willing to take? You know, if, if the doctor is not willing to discount, I thought you were being very reasonable, honestly, 100K off. I, mean, I don't know how if the purchase price is 500K and you're taking 100K off, it's kind of a big hit. But if it's like a million, um, you know, Matt says business masters is best taken early in ownership. That's a great point, right? Because it, it's more relevant to your practice when you actually own one. Um, so you could take it twice. I don't know. Um, I took it pre-ownership. So that's why I said that he took it early in ownership. So that's why he's saying that. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, if the seller says no, that's their right. They get to sell their practice for the price they choose. And um, ultimately, you know, it's up to you if you still want to buy that practice. The seller is nothing. The seller is, he can be unhappy about it. And he can say he wants to sell the practice for the price we agreed on. I mean, I think it's a little insensitive to not like even consider that COVID happened. Like that seems a little odd to me. Um, but ultimately, right, COVID happened. And yeah, I mean, it's up to you. Do I still want this practice for this price? Yes or no? I mean, I don't know how good the practice is. I don't know how hard it is to find. I don't know. You know, those are questions I'd ask myself. Typically, I'd probably take it, to be honest. It'd be just me, personally. But um, if I was going to buy it pre-COVID, I'd probably buy it post-COVID. Especially if the dentist is willing to own it throughout COVID. Like, a lot of these deals are getting pushed out till like, COVID kind of calms down. So... And right, I'm not saying COVID, like I'm not trying to get political. So like, it's going to come back. You know, I don't, I'm not going to like get in that conversation. Um, a certain dentist that has a shtick that rhymes with, well, I ran a webinar this morning along with the CPA advising avoiding by practice for a while. Who is right here? <laughs> um, I don't know who the dentist is that ran the webinar that rhymes with, I don't know. Oh, Achos, Tachos. Um, nachos? This is Paul. Um, yeah, I mean, like we're, I think we're all talking about avoiding buying a practice like right now, but we're saying start looking right now and buy one soon, right? Like, yeah, I, um, 
right? You want to see 60 to, you know, I'd say like 80%, 60 to 80% of production return before I feel comfortable pulling the trigger. Um, I preferably would like to see more than that. Like, but yeah, you want to see revenue return before you actually close, you know, but I don't think one is right or wrong, right? We're kind of both saying the same thing, but I think we, it's just differing views on how long it takes till that revenue returns. And I mean, I don't know um, who is right here. I think, right. Nobody knows, but we're telling you to take advantage of the opportunity, have something lined up and worst case scenario, you have something lined up and you don't buy it. What did you lose sometime? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, um, any impact on PPP, I think stipulations on any sale or acquisition, um, the PPP is like a two month program. So yeah, I mean, that doesn't super affect, I mean, past two months. It, I mean, I don't know the stipulations as they affect acquisitions. Um, but that loan closes in two months and then it's either a loan that pays back that the seller carries or that's a seller's debt and you either assume it or not. That's a deal you negotiate. Um, but PPP, uh, that's over in two months. So two months from when it gets funded. So, I mean. I don't know. Mine hasn't funded yet, but again, I think everyone's like two months. Like if I started buying a practice right now, it'd probably take me four months. So I think these timelines are a little goofy. Um, like PPP is like definitely past two months. Um, okay. So do you recommend startups at times if I can't find what I'm looking for? So it's funny. Uh, I get this so much with startups. So what bank did you use? You're happy with it. So I really like Lendever as a bank. I'll just answer that one first because it was quick. Okay. Um, do I recommend startups at um, times where you can't find what I'm looking for? So this is the thing I like about startups. It, it has like this perception as easy because you don't have to find a practice. All you have to do is find an available space. But the thing with a startup is it's super important to find like a great space, like a really great visible space, really hard to find. I would say equally as hard to find as like a great practice. <laughs> so um, I think a lot of people view a startup as a compromise when really, I mean, if you want to buy a practice, I feel like a startup and should be, if I want to have a startup, I'll do a startup. If I want to buy a practice, I'll buy a practice. And if you can't find what I'm looking for, then I would ask you how hard are you looking and how great is your deal finding? Uh, because you guys, right? You guys only see your perspective. You only see people, you won't like, if, if like this, this guy is struggling, right? And a lot of people are sometimes struggle to find a practice. That's all you see. So you think like, that's the situation, right? But I've had two buyers in the same market. One sends me like a deal a week and the other one's like, can't find anything. I'm going to do a startup. And it's the same market. Like, you know, honestly, it, it has a lot to do with deal finding. Um, so I would, I would, if you're thinking about doing a startup because you're struggling buying a practice, then I would say you should not do a startup because you do not want to buy, you're having a hard time buying a practice. You want to buy a practice, try better deal finding first. Um, honestly, I feel like if you're really good at deal finding, you'll find one. I, I just, I haven't seen that situation before where somebody can't find a practice because they, and they had great deal finding techniques. Um, that's really rare. And I mean, I don't know. As you're thinking about building your group, are you thinking about bringing on doctors as partners or associates? Uh, personally associates, um, not partners. Okay. There are many discounted practices. Yeah. I mean, people say the discounted for a reason. They say not to buy these, just saying what our market people say in our neck of the woods. So four to six practices here considered, um, are considered also not many use for dental hygienists on like us and Canada. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, just saying what, oh, okay. Okay. Maybe you're responding to what I said. Um, could high hygiene mean there's not enough? Uh, no. So high hygiene typically means that uh, the, the towel is not being wrung very effectively. So, right, there is that component of like a, a younger demographic is going to typically have a higher hygiene percentage than older demographic. But we're not talking like crazy hygiene. Like if somebody's doing 15% hygiene, it's not because their patients are old. It's because, you know, they're, they're really doing well at maximizing production. And conversely, if somebody has like 35, 36% hygiene, it's probably not, unless the population is like very young. Um, or the carries risk is very low, but in general, right, you're going to be 20 to 30. That's pretty much where everyone lies. So I would look at if high hygiene percentage, I would look at procedures that are offered and if they offer specialty procedures. Um, yeah. So it's a lot of not diagnosing enough. So uh, Dr. Hoda put it in the comments for us. So that's, that's, I mean, I'm, I, I'm like not supposed to just like say that publicly a lot, a ton, but I, I, I mention it every once in a while, but yeah, it's a lot of a diagnosis. Um, and we talk about this in the ownership accelerator going through the red flags and you'll be able to tell why the hygiene percentage is high. Um, how easy is transition of Monday to Friday practice to three to hours? Uh, 
uh, <laughs> um, well, considering the whew, I just did, um, right? I mean, I don't know how big the practice. So this guy's asking about a Monday through Friday practice to a three day practice, three day weeks, 12 hour shifts. So, I mean, I don't know how many staff you have. It's all staff, right? Patients can adjust. Patients will actually appreciate the evening hours. Um, but uh, three days a week. I mean, I'd probably recommend like a Monday through Friday that you like alternate. So like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, one week. And then once it Thursday, Friday, the other week, so you could have like the five day weekend every other week or whatever that is. Um, but anyway, the, uh, you know, 12 hour shifts. I mean, how is the staff going to respond? I don't know. Um, I typically would not want to go in with that plan. Um, but if, if you can convince your staff of it, like that's a leadership challenge. Um, but I mean, if that's what you want to do, then you might have to get new staff. I don't know. Um, it just, I mean, if the office is small, it's easier. If the office is larger. It's a lot harder because you have more team members, um, but then you could potentially grow into that. So I don't know. I, I would typically would not own a group practice and op only open it three days. So it's probably a solo. So, you know, you might get a couple different team members, but maybe you can get the other ones to be agreeable to it. I think it'd be fine. Um, any good recommendation of getting new patients during this time? People may not want to get their mail. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah, people might want to touch their mail. Um, um, yeah. I mean, new patients during this time is probably not happening, right? People are staying at home. Um, so I would just kind of get ready for when you're back. And then I would, there's, so, I mean, this is an ownership topic, but when you get back, you want to focus on recall first and then, you know, your new patient flow will kind of, uh, might, might taper, or might, uh, kind of take a while to get back up to where it was. How much weight do you put on 15? I put a lot of weight on hygiene percentage. Um, yeah, so hygiene percentage is very important to me because it tells me uh, the internal growth opportunities of the practice. So if it's 15% hygiene, then I'm looking at negative internal growth, right? The practice might dip versus I'm looking at, um, so 35% hygiene, you know, the likely I'll be able to grow that practice in a few months pretty easily. Okay. And it's funny because like I say that and, it, you know, I, I, I just hate the scarcity mindset out there because I walk into a practice and like, especially when I get a coaching client, like, yeah, we can grow practices pretty quickly. And I think that people, people view that as abrasive. I mean, it just is the reality of the situation. If you know what to do, it's not super hard. Um, this isn't like, I mean, it's not rocket science at the end of the day. Like it's a dental practice. We see patients, we do dentistry. Like it's not that hard. Um, I think people make it hard, but it doesn't have to be. Anyway, total, total tangent. But if you have the ultimate goal of owning multiple practices, are you changing your criteria for your first practice purchase or does it not really change? Um, so I, yeah, right. I, I kind of mentioned that I'm buying additional practice. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, it's the practice model that you want to buy. So I want to buy groups. Um, I just like larger practices. So I'm just looking for those. I mean, my first practice wasn't a great group practice to buy, to be honest. Um, I think I've talked about that enough on air. Um, so I want a better one than the one I bought first. I think, um, but you know, you want one that fits your plan. So if your plan is a trial partner partnership route or whatever, then you want, you want your, so I, again, begin with the end in mind. I think if that's a theme taken away here, you know, start with the type of practice you want to buy. And then like, what does that look like pre-acquisition? So if you want one that has to, you know, do well with an associate, then you need to look at it through that lens and maybe a higher hygiene percentage, maybe not as much production, not as many specialty procedures, you know, depending on your plan has a lot to do with your strategy. So um, I would look at what your multiple practices look like and then try to find acquisition opportunities that fit that mold. Hopefully that answers your question, Brandon. Would there actually be a price cut? Um, yeah, so... Right. I think nobody knows for sure if there's going to be a price cut or not. I think it's very deal specific. And that's why I don't want us to bank on the price cut. That's not why we're doing this. We're doing this because of the availability of practices right now. And the sellers have time. They're doing nothing. Like this is the time to contact sellers. Uh, I think Richard talked about their, their cell phones are on the answering machine right now. Like this is the time to contact people and get these deals going. So um, yeah, I mean, whether the, I mean, and there's a lot of focus on the price cut and it's a possibility more so than it was pre COVID right? But is it a certainty? No. I mean, we just had a comment earlier talking about how it's not. Then I know that you posted that before that was discussed, but still, you know, I, I just, um, with less technology, when would you start buying technology after COVID? Uh, yeah, cash flow. Cash flow dictates how fast I upgrade. And, you know, if there's an upgrade that will help me, like for me, paper charts, I don't like because I, I can't get metrics on paper charts. So I would, I would update, I would go pretty digital and have a practice management software pretty quickly. That is a change I'd make fast. And then um, the, the metrics would allow me to further grow my practice. So, but in general changes, you know, as you can afford them and as they offer more revenue. 
I've been on this for like an hour 40. Let me get some more lighting in here. Okay. So I need to add this purchase for minus 100K was advice of my CPA. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just going to say this, right? I don't know your CPA. I'm sure they're a great person. Um, in general, professionals can be very short sighted sometimes, right? Like they're not thinking about you owning this practice for the next 20 years. They're thinking about getting you, you know, what is right or fair or whatever. And that might not always be, you know, in your best interest as the buyer. I think us as buyers, we need to be visionaries and we need to, uh, go into these situations looking at what's in our best interest for the next 20 years of our career. And if it's, if it's the best practice for the next 20, 30 years of your career, um, then, you know, pay what you have to, to get it in my mind. But, um, yeah, I mean, CPAs obviously disagree with me, you know, I mean, my lawyer and I, in the middle of our deal, I love my lawyer. He's awesome. Great lawyer. I use Rob Montgomery's firm, Justin Weaver. Awesome guy. Love him. You know, those times he's like, you know, this is a little risky. Like I understand the risks. I'm taking it because I want the practice. You as the buyer are the one to pull the trigger. Your accountant can give you advice, but you're ultimately the one that, you know, is responsible for those decisions. Um, so, you know, use your professionals for what they are, information, and make decisions. That's what you like. It's like we're the patients deciding what we want to do with our teeth. You know, it's the same type of thing, right? The professionals are telling us what we need to do, and it's up to us to make the decision. So I'm working as an associate in practice. Location may not work for me for more than five to 10 years. I really enjoy working here, profitable practice, better than any other value in my area. I know you marry yourself to a practice. How do you feel about marriage? <laughs> divorce in five to 10 years. You're talking to somebody who got divorced in five years. Um, paying off a lot of loans and acquiring wealth in the meantime. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, right, five is kind of the minimum number of years I'd own a practice before I sold it again. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're like going to stay there five or 10 years, I wouldn't mind buying the practice. I mean, it's not like the best plan in the world in my mind. I'd rather just move five to 10 years earlier to wherever I'm going to live long-term and get established there. But if for whatever reason, that's not possible, like five to 10 years is kind of a weird timeline to stay somewhere. Um, but nonetheless, 10 years is a solid amount of time to own a practice before selling it. That wouldn't be like a flip red flag to me. Um, but five years, that's like kind of cutting it. I mean, I would rather just move five years earlier to wherever I'm going to live for the next 20 years, you know, and then do that. But yeah, I mean, no problem in buying a practice and selling it five to 10 years later. But I think five is like the minimum number of years um, that I would be married to the practice if we're going to use a marriage divorce. Um, how do you find contact info of a lender? Uh, Lendever, I think um, they're actually, they have this pretty cool COVID thing they're doing. So I think they're going to be, we, they just got some ads from us. So they'll be coming on air. Um, I mean, there's a lot of lenders. I mean, banking, uh, like Google, um, you know, dental practice loan, stuff like that. But I mean, there's the big, pretty much every bank offers a dental practice loan. So it's like how to find a bank to bank. Um, brokers usually represent the seller. What is dual representation brokers? I already talked about dual representation brokers. Um, so I'll skip that question. Essentially, it is a seller's broker that charges the buyer as well. Um, it's, it's impossible to represent both, um, but doesn't mean don't use them in my mind. If they have the right practice, then I'm willing to use them. I said thanks, but elaborate more on the 50-50 partnership, please. The pros, cons, I like the autonomy, not answering to somebody, but with our very seller market, a possible 50 partnership with a very business-oriented owner has come up. Yeah, Hoda, I would just look at, again, like how much, um, how much money am I making and how much am I working and what problems do I have? And if that's good enough for me and I'm getting frustrated, the partnership isn't a bad idea. I mean, it's just, it's like a very personal uh, decision. It's, do you want the, like, you know, um, it's just what problems do you want? And uh, my parents are walking into my house right now. Um, so don't mind them. I'm, um, uh, but anyway, so for students out there, um, what's best to do during these times? Capitalize. Yeah. So as when you're a student, you really want to pay um, for ultimately, you know, you really want to do what is best for your long-term future. So I would start thinking about what I want and what I'm going to be doing and, uh, you know, all that stuff. And then try to prepare for that it, while you're in dental school. So that is how I would do that. Let me let my parents know that I am on my way. Okay. All right. I texted my parents. I told them uh, they're coming, hanging out with me for a couple of days. Anyway, so uh, for students out there, yeah. So just take your time in dental school, figure out your future plans and what you want to do with your life and then use your time in dental school to prepare for that. So that's how I would approach that situation. 
And I, I mean, if you're in dental school, right, the economy doesn't super affect you, but you can use the time that you have with school off to prepare for your future. That's probably how I would use it. Um, there is a recording of the webinar. Matt's sending it via email. Um, I know what you are offering. Is there a Canadian equivalent to your company? I don't think so. I don't think there's a Canadian. I mean, honestly, I think we are the only, uh, when I created the Ownership Accelerator, we were the only course for practice. That's why I did it. I didn't do this because I wanted to. I did it because there was nothing else out there. Um, there's a lack of practice in the area I want to buy. And um, I have a seller who has a perfect practice for me and would sell to me in a few years. Would you ever consider buying the practice and having the seller stay for three to five years as an associate? I have a good associateship currently. Yeah. I mean, if I'm looking to have a group practice, I have no problem with the seller staying long-term. I love reverse associateships. Um, they're, they're complicated, right? Like a seller staying for three years is quite a long time. Um, but you know, I see a situation with that working. You know, It's worked very well for many. Um, but if it's like a solo practice and there's not enough room for both of you, three to five years is a really long time to not, you know, have enough dentistry to do. So depending on the type of practice, I, I, I like that idea. Um, a good time to buy. Um, is renting at 12% of collections. How would you decide? Yeah, so this is pretty much how do you decide if you should buy the building or not? So if it's, you know, ultimately it has a lot to do with the uh, the practice itself, right? If it's a good deal. And uh, it cash flows, right? It's like the same way I'd buy rental property, right? So it's $100,000 a year for rent. How much is it for your mortgage and all of your related ownership related expenses? If it's similar, I'd probably do ownership of the building because then I'm also building equity in the building while owning it over those years. So if it costs more to own it than rent it, then that's when I would make a decision of is the equity that I'm building worth it to me? Um, what about collections percentage? So I, yeah, I think I've answered that. Um, it's not a, not a number I care about a whole lot. I don't use that number when I make decisions about practices. I use uh, net worth or net income and the multiple of it. So which practice will be the most profitable during a depression? Um, procedures and insurance types. Yeah, I mean, insurance, right? Patients that have insurance pay less out of pocket. So during a financial recession, that's typically the better practice for you to own. Um, but ultimately, right, procedures that have higher copays, stuff like that, a lot less elective procedures is typically what suffers in a recession. Um, those would be the types of practices. But I mean, again, like, I don't know. It's a very area dependent and the industries in your area, if they don't lose their insurance exactly. Right. And so like, if you have like Vegas, that's a perfect example of a market that, you know, you have a lot of people that could potentially lose employment and lose dental benefits um, versus, you know, a market that's a lot more diverse in its employer groups maybe are not nearly as affected. And so depending on the market you live in. Um, yeah. So there's a D3 in here asking about, you know, the potential, yeah, so um, yeah, Hoda's making the point that yes, you know, ortho was it's an elective procedure, you know, in a sense, and so it it's affected more than non-elective procedures. So um, currently, D three, D four. I'm like, I see the light at the tunnel. I got twelve questions left, eighty four answered already. Man, you guys are asking a ton of questions. So I am currently D three, D four, and um, looking. So it depends on your plans, right? What type of practice do you want to own? When do you want to buy it? I like, so uh, I think one plan I really like is trying to associate in a group practice you want to buy. If you want to buy a group practice, something that can support multiple doctors, being the associate in that practice is, would be really awesome. Pre-ownership, that'd be nice. And, um, you know, that, that would be my preference. <laughs> Let it get to 100 questions. I, I'm like pretty much there. I mean, if I just answer all these, I got 96. Um, but anyway. So I would, I would look at my future plans. Do I want a solo versus a group? If I want a solo, then probably working in the practice for a while would be tough. Um, but if I want to have a group practice and I'd like to work in that practice for a bit, that'd be an ideal situation walking out of school into the practice that I plan to own in the future. Whether or not that works out, I have no idea. Um, 525K selling price, fee for service practice, one dentist, one front desk, two part-time hygienists. Um, again, how much does the cash flow? Uh, 1.8 times. Oh, so that's what we were, I think that's the question. So we said 1.8 times, let's test my memory. 1.8 times net income, 100% of collection. So it's 50% uh, overhead. So then we're doing two, this is me doing 262 is that. And then if it's sell price 525, then our debt's like, so you're making 200K a year um, post debt around 190. I mean, I don't know. I personally wouldn't love that opportunity. Fee for service, making 190 uh, after debt, that's pre COVID reduction. I, I wouldn't personally not enjoy that. I mean, in general, just cause fever service, not doing a whole lot, not a ton of patients there. Um, I personally would not, um, 
what are the podcast numbers on partnership somewhere in season two with Brian Pender? Um, I don't know the episode number. I, uh, I only, I only know one episode number season two, episode nine. That was my first one. Um, past that, I don't remember them. Um, when, when going through a practice analysis, what indicators you look for first? Hygiene percentage, cash flow, crown of three, four, six, filling, fixed costs. Yeah, so those are all things I look at. And I mean, that's like asking me, uh, I mean, that's like a really loaded question about like everything that I look at. But I think in general, you're looking at correct number of operatories, patient flow evaluated through hygiene percentage, uh, cash flow, and your fixed costs. And yeah, crown of three, four, service fillings, uh, probably that's like a really solid list. Um, and then you just, uh, those things will lead you to more questions, right? It's like, that's like your initial FMX. And then if you need to like look at a specific area in more depth, then you, you know, you further evaluate, but that would be like a great place to start for sure. Um, do you have any guidelines for a good number of pedo practices without hygienists? Yeah, I, I got, I got, um, good. No, I, I don't No, I don't have pedo numbers for you, man. Um, sorry, Dustin. I know you actually, I think you're in Seattle or the nor the Northwest, but, um, yeah, I don't. I don't have good pedo information. I apologize. I wish I did. Um, so I'm sorry. Uh, pedo is pedo is a whole another animal because it's. I would just look at cash flow, right? Because it's it's very hygiene, very like potentially Medicaid dependent. Um, but I would look mainly at your cash flow. I don't have good numbers for you. So uh, your greatest fear, Tan, is that the staff is quitting when you buy. So looking for new staff, right? I mean, we all know about Craigslist. Yeah, Craigslist. I actually love Craigslist as a way to hire people. So my staff keeps trying to use Indeed. And they, they so now at this point, my staff hires, uh, but they use Indeed. And I like Craigslist. I mean, tomato, tomato. Uh, there's tons of ways to hire people. I wouldn't be super concerned about staff turnover. I mean, obviously you want to avoid it, but I think you can do great with or without it. If the, if the right people are there, then you want to keep them. If the wrong people are there, um, I like that. Feel the fear, but do it anyway. That, that's like the whole theme of the webinar, really. I mean, that's like, we're talking about practice acquisition, really we're talking about uncertainty and fear. Um, will you ever consider practice where the doctor's hygiene himself? Um, yeah. I mean, I want to see the, the percentage of, you know, hygiene related procedures. I mean, I wouldn't love it. I, I would rather walk into something with a hygienist already. Um, typically, if the doc is doing the hygiene, there's not a ton of patients there because otherwise they would be a full-time hygienist. So um, typically, I don't love that opportunity on the surface, um, but, you know, yeah, I, I don't love it on the surface, but I wouldn't like rule it out just for that fact. But my guess is if they're doing their own hygiene, it probably doesn't have enough patients to support even one dentist. So I probably wouldn't buy it for that reason. Um, would I pay a higher multiple for a group versus solo? Uh, probably, yeah. I think you typically pay more for a group. Typically is what that ends up as, but I don't know. I mean, I don't, uh, EBIT, so here's how I look at it. If if I'm buying a group, I'm looking at EBITDA more than I'm looking at net income. If I'm buying a solo, I'm looking more at net income. So I think you just analyze them a little differently. Okay. We have, right, I, I got four left and we're at 92. So I'll be at 96. We got four more questions for me. We can hit 100. I think uh, Tanner wants me to hit 100. So let's see if we can do it. Um, if a practice has a low hygiene percentage, does this mean it'll be hard to turn around or, for example, introduce a hygienist? Um, a low hygiene percentage means it's hard to reproduce. That means that, you know, there's not a whole lot of dentistry to be done compared to the current production. And so that's just hard to reproduce. And so you want the higher hygiene percentage. I, I mean, how many patients are inactive? How hard it would be to add another hygienist? Those are different questions than the percent hygiene percentage. But in general, yeah, it's an uphill battle in all ways, including adding more hygiene. Um, have practices that came gross over mill and seller is, have practices that came up but the seller is about four hours from me. Oh, okay. So a practice came up doing over a mill and is desperate. Um, yeah, I wouldn't buy a rural practice with the plan of putting an associate, especially if it's a desperate sale. Um, that sounds like a difficult situation, getting an associate to go work there and then potentially reproduce. I would only uh, work rural unless if you are, the, I wouldn't be an absentee owner of a rural practice personally. Um, you must, you would need partnerships or something to really keep people there. Um, that wouldn't be something I'd kind of buy on a fire sale. Um, I would, I would, if I'm going to move there for a bit, work there and then stabilize the doctor situation, that might not be bad, but I wouldn't just like run to that situation. Um, seems like we got two more questions. I had two more and I hit a hundred. Uh, it would be hard to not sound like a pure businessman or potentially just so and charm the seller. If you're sending letters for your second practice compared to your first practice thoughts. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think definitely it's harder to, 
uh, appeal to the like I want to be like your the child you never had buying your practice appeal that um, you can have as a, b- a buyer if you're looking to buy multiple. Yeah, that just doesn't exist. Um, it's a more pragmatic conversation. Yes, we hit a hundred. All right, no more questions. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna answer these and then I'm done. I'm answering a hundred and then I'm logging off. Um, so yes, it, when you're buying multiple. Uh, yes, it is. It's a different conversation. Typically, you're employing the seller for a couple of years, so you're just selling them on the benefits of you know you keep your job, you work in a couple of years, and then you retire and you get paid. Now it, it's a totally different conversation. You're absolutely correct. Um, on a recent episode, you mentioned that you know a lot about insurance verification. Could you share some of the resources where you learned some of this info? And uh, you know, starting D three year, and I have many practice purchase options. Well, good for you, Brandon. Um, but I feel so unknowledgeable on this particular subject. So yeah, this is, this is a subject you got to walk into a practice and see how it works. This is one of those things that's really hard to learn because it's a lot to do with the way they do it. Like you can learn ideal practice. You can go to breakaway and you can learn how to do insurance verification or whatever. Um, it's not very hard to learn how to do. It's just, you ask patients, you know, ask questions to insurance companies, about like these certain questions before the patient comes in for their appointment. And that's really it. And uh, you know, it's not like super complicated. It's just how are they currently doing it? And how are you going to implement a system that works in your practice with your team and their skills, strengths, and weaknesses? It's very situation dependent, unfortunately. I mean, there is a best practices way of doing it that wouldn't be very hard to learn. It's just the, uh, the implementation of it is where a lot of problems come in. Um, So if you have two hygienists, 16 patients a day booked two weeks in advance, when do you hire a third hygienist? Yeah. Now Um, (laughs) if two hygienists booked, 16 patients a day, two weeks out. Yeah, I'm hiring another hygienist. Yeah, for sure. Um, and what's next for <laughs> Dr. Hariri and George? Oh, geez. Um, okay, so uh, when do I hire a third hygienist? Yeah, I, um, you know, I mean, I mean, it depends on your, so this is where I like practice by numbers, right? We're not talking about ownership a whole lot here, but this is where I want, I want a dashboard. I want to see my recall overdue percentage. I want to see my new patient flow. I, you know, it's how much hygiene do you open is the question. Not do you open another, do you open more hygiene? Um, I'd say probably start with a couple days, day and a half, two days. And, um, but I want to see those. I want to, you know, you can't just open hygiene without a plan. You want to see how much do you have available you know, where, where are your excess patients going to come from and how do you get them in the schedule? You know, I, as much as I talk about opening up hygiene, I love it, but you have to have some sort of plan behind doing it. So what's next for me? Uh, you'll have to wait and see. Uh, tune into the show. I'll probably, you know, we're pretty transparent in general, all three of us about our lives. So we'll continue to be that way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what you guys should be doing. I'm, I'm looking at the COVID market and I'm going to see what I can do, right? Um, would you send letters to off-market practices no matter what age it is? I would do 55 and up. So uh, 55 and up is the age of which I would send somebody a letter. Uh, under 55, I would not, personally. But if you can't find age, then right, then send them to everybody and just pay the, pay the postage and everything um, or find age and spend a lot of time doing that. But 55 plus is the, best, is the best way to do that. I'll type one answer. I haven't typed an answer this whole time. I did 100 of these. So my 100th answer, I typed it. All right. So sorry, could low hygiene mean the dentist isn't actively doing six on three calls or therefore there isn't an opportunity? Uh, it technically could mean that, but it typically does not. So um, yes, it can, but that doesn't mean it is. So that's my best way of answering that question. Um, so that is 101 answered questions. Answer one more, 101, Clay. I think that's enough. Um, I'm done, guys. That was two hours of me talking nonstop. And um, my parents just got here, so I'm gonna have fun with some family. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Matt said he's going to send out an email. And again, uh, we're running the special on the Ownership Accelerator until the end of the month. Um, so take advantage of that. I think, honestly, I'm, I'm impressed with how many people in the comments have taken the course and are still back for more webinars with George. Um, so ha- I'm happy to have, we had like 200 people here. That's awesome. And 75 still left. So that was a lot of fun. Um, thanks, guys. I'm going to log off now. And I uh, really appreciate you guys tuning in. <laughs>